Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, it's Monday, which means it's time for McDougal Monday, where we are joined by Dr. John McDougal and his wife, Mary, and he is going to be giving a brand new lecture based on the gastrointestinal system, GI health. He's gonna do part one today and part two in two weeks. And today he's gonna to focus on the upper GI tract. Now I'm sure you know that Dr. McDougall has multiple best-selling books and you're probably familiar with his book, The Starch Solution or the McDougall Program for Maximum Weight Loss. Many of his books are wonderful, but my favorite might be Digestive Tune-Up. So he really does, because it's got pictures in it and it's really fun to read. So he really does know a lot about your GI health, and he's here to talk about it. Please welcome Dr. John McDougall. People voted that they really wanted to hear this topic from you. Well, thank you, uh, AJ. I, I think it's, it's a really important topic after all. You know, everything everything that happens to you starts with your intestinal tract. And, uh, you know, that the, the intestinal tract is the portal of entry of most of our environment. You know, the other way we get our environment to enter it to us is we breathe it. You know, that through the lungs, we absorb some of the environment. Of course, you can easily think about contaminated air and cigarette smoke and decide that that's a portal that can be easily damaged by poisons and toxins, particularly if you happen to be a tobacco user. But, you know, a marijuana user or somebody who lives downwind from a factory, we're talking about uh, injury that way. But otherwise, uh, essentially all of the other contact you have with your environment is through your gastrointestinal tract. And what we're talking about here is food and water. But I'm gonna be discussing the food issues with you right now. You know that you need clean air and uh, clean water and uh, you need clean food too. And uh, what I've been spending my lifetime trying to, trying to come up with is uh, what is the food that allows you to look and feel your best, to function your best, to live your longest? You know, what would that diet be? And you know, I, I think, well, let's just put it this way. I'm happy with what I came up with more than 46 years ago. You know why I'm happy is because when I prescribe this kind of, uh, of eating to people is they come back and they say, I, you know, it's a miracle. Uh, thank you very much. You know, I, I just didn't cost me anything. It's uh, cut my food bill dramatically. And boy, everything you promised, I got. And I, this is what I promise you is that if you have dietary diseases caused by the Western diet, which is what 80% of the people have in our society, then if you stop that poisoning, the rich Western diet, the meat, or any, any animal products at all, be they secretions or animal parts, and the oil, you know, this is not, this is not part of the human diet. I know, I know the dairy industry and meat industry have taught us all differently but it's not true. And it's been recently that the, uh, that the fishing industry has taught us that in order to be healthy and to have a good heart and a good brain, we've got to destroy the fish population. No, that's not true either. So what I want to talk to you about over the next, uh, well, couple of sessions is I want, I want to talk to you about the intestinal tract and we'll do the upper end, then we'll do later on the lower. And hopefully I'll stimulate some questions uh, for, from you uh, about this particular topic. When I, when I decided to write Dr. McDougall's Digestive Tune-Up, which I wrote, was published in the year 2007. So what is that? That's 15 years ago. Yeah, still a national bestseller. You can get it on Amazon. Uh, the, the, it's an active bestseller. I mean, the book company has not given me the title back like it has with a few other, other of my books. Yeah, they still make a, a, a lot of money off the book. And it, it was tough when I decided to write this because I mean, the intestinal tract, I mean, this, this is a, 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 an area of the body that's shrouded in mystery. And also it's considered by and large dirty, isn't it? Shameful. You, 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 don't, you don't want to talk about your bowels, but they need to be talked about. And um, so I took the big step and, and decided to write a book. And, and, and I actually got a comedy writer to help me with this book because I figured we had to introduce a little bit of humor in it. And, that's not really all that funny, but people tell me that they are able to read it from cover to cover and without putting it down and they enjoy it. And boy, boy, that was, that was a compliment. I didn't know that I would, would do that well when I started out deciding to write this book. And uh, I, also, I also got a lot of help here from 
a good friend of mine, actually, he started out being a, a patient that I, that I uh, made contact with over the internet. And this is him right here. This is, this is my friend, Howard Bartner. And he did the illustrations for the book. And the illustrations you're gonna to see today were done by Howard Bartner. Howard Bartner was the, the head of medical illustration for the National Institutes of Health. That's what he did his whole life. He just drew pictures for doctors and scientists. And this is a self-portrait of Howard. But when I first made contact with Howard, he was uh, in a hospital room. And he wrote me and he said, well, you know, I've read your books and I know lots of doctors. So I, I spend my, my life with doctors, you know, drawing pictures for them. So I've gotten to know them pretty well. And boy, I, I'm in big trouble. I've got high blood pressure. I've got heart disease. They want to do heart surgery on me. You know, is there any way I can get out of this? I said, look, Howard, you know, I'm not your doctor, but you know, like most of you, I write you back and tell you what to do. So Howard decided that he was going to sign himself out against advice. And after a few days, he was going to have the heart surgery and went home, changed his diet. And like pretty much everybody I can imagine or think about or remember, he got well, you know, because he stopped the food poisoning. His arteries cleaned out, his blood pressure came down. He did really, really well. Well, Howard, uh, he got together with me on this book to make the book a lot more enjoyable, entertaining, and educational. And so the drawings are his. The first time I met Howard was on one of our adventure trips to, um, to Alaska. And he and his wife uh, came on this trip. And, and the first time we ever got together personally. And uh, actually, this is what motivated him to do the drawings for me, is uh, on this particular trip, on this boat, we did not have a projector. You know, we used to use projectors to use slides. Well, there's no projector and there was no screen and there wasn't even any, I don't think any electricity in the lounge. So I was done as far as being able to show slides. And so what I had to do is I had to draw. And I, so I got a white piece of paper out and I, I drew the things that I wanted people to see. And here's Howard, the head of the, uh, of the medical arts division of the National Institutes of Health, watching me draw these pictures. And my, my artwork is worse than Doug Lyle's. Just to give you some idea of how, how, how he was, he was uh, so upset that I would, you know, present my important material this way. But Howard, that's all I had. So anyway, he, he agreed to, uh, to do the illustrations with it. But, I, you know, I remember Howard very well. And, you know, one morning we're, <clears throat> we're standing out in the, on the early in the morning, standing on the deck of the ship. And we're watching the ice flows go by and the seals that are laid out all on the ice flows, just a beautiful, beautiful scene in nature. And I said to Howard, he said, look, you know, you're doing really good, aren't you? He says, yeah. He says, you know, I got myself out of heart surgery and, and um, I don't have any more chest pain and I feel good and all my numbers are better. And I said, well, you're off all your pills too, aren't you, Howard? And he says, he says no, I'm not. I said, well, look, I told you, you should stop all your blood pressure pills. You don't have high blood pressure anymore. He said, yeah, I know. I don't have any high blood pressure anymore. He said, but I'm not going to stop my last blood pressure pill. And the reason, John, is this. He says, I, uh, the, the doctor prescribed me as one of my best friends. And, and I, I countered everything else he wanted me to do and didn't do it, you know, for me to, to uh, stop the last pill. I'm afraid I'll offend him. I'll ruin our friendship. And I said, well, I understand how you feel, Howard, but you're taking a calcium channel blocker, which is increases your risk of heart disease and cancer and suicide and good grief. I mean, it can't be that good of a friend. And he said, well, he is. So I said, I tell you what, Howard, why don't you do this? Why don't you take the pill every morning, put it in your mouth, don't swallow it, swish it around a little bit and spit it in the sink and let it go out with the wastewater. He said, yeah, that's a good idea. Then I will have to, I won't have to tell him I'd stop taking the pill. Well, I said, no, you won't, Howard. He said, but you know, I'm not going to do it here. He said, because I know where that wastewater goes. He said, I'm not, I'm not going to poison the seals and the fish. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is a strong message from Howard and my, myself to you, is if you have medications left over, and you will when you change your diet, you'll have pretty much all of them ready for the wastebasket. Don't throw them in the sink or in the toilet. The, these are toxic. These, these, the estrogens femi feminize the fish. Now, all kinds of terrible things go on as a result of the, the medications that people dump in the toilet. 
Take them to take them to the pharmacy where there's a toxic waste dump. That's how they need to be disposed of. Anyway, that, that's Howard, great man to say the least. So to make this an enjoyable trip, I employed two patients, Larry and Louise. Uh, Larry and Louise will take us through a trip through the gastrointestinal tract and show us some of the things that are going on. Uh, first thing I'd like to share with you is that the, the gastrointestinal tract is a long tube. It's about, about 38 feet long, goes from the mouth to the, to the anus. And uh, this tube is important for you to understand lies outside of the body. And, and as a result, this tube, the surfaces of this tube are in contact with the environment directly. Now, let me, let me explain this a little, a little bit, a little bit easier to understand is when, when you are in a, a floating in the inner tube on the lake, uh, when you were floating in the inner tube, you weren't inside the inner tube, were you? No, you, you were still outside of the, of the inner tube, the rubber. To get in the inner tube, you had to pierce the rubber of the inner tube to get inside. And so it is with the intestinal tract. This, this long tube lies outside of the body, which explains to you why the intestinal tract gets well so quickly and why when we go out and we do things that aren't so good for ourselves, we get something called McDougal's Revenge immediately within minutes to hours. And I think some of you know what McDougal's Revenge is. Anyway, uh, this is the tube we're going to be talking about. I, I'd like to divide this discussion into three parts, and we'll talk about two of the parts uh, today and the last part, not our next time together. Uh, I want to talk to you about the upper intestinal tract, which goes from the lips down through the chest cavity, through a tube called the esophagus, uh, into the stomach. And there I want to talk to you about some organs that lie uh, in this particular vicinity, they are the liver and the gallbladder, which is right here. And then we'll go on maybe a little bit about the small intestine, but we'll talk about the large intestine the next time around. Uh, the <clears throat> intestinal tract begins with the mouth. And most people realize what you put in your mouth determines whether the mouth is healthy or diseased. Why? Because you've been told by dentists that sugar causes cavities, and it does. The uh, simple sugars, uh, they uh, reside in the mouth after we eat them. And there's certain bacteria that actually destroy enamel. And, and these bacteria will start the cavity process. Well, you may end up losing some teeth this way. And so of course you need to keep your sugar intake low because sugar causes cavities. Now you can also brush right after you eat a sugary dessert or candy or whatever. You, you, can, you can brush your teeth, that helps. That gets some of the sugar out of the mouth. And of course, you can just, if you don't have a toothbrush, you can just rinse with water. And, and you'll remove a tremendous amount of sugar from around the teeth. And that should be a good habit practice for you. Uh, the, uh, the teeth, they run into problems uh, such as uh, loose teeth due to the bone around the tooth becoming degenerated. And this, this occurs for the same reason and at the same rate as bone loss occurs throughout the rest of the body. You know, we talk about bone loss in the spine, and bone loss in the hips, and, you know, the extremities, and we call it osteoporosis or osteopenia. Well, the same thing happens in the dental area, your, your mandible and your maxilla. Uh, they're bones and it's bones at which the teeth sit into. And through a lifetime of eating the rich Western diet that's very acidic, you end up dissolving the bones all throughout the body, including the bones in your maxilla and mandible. In other words, your jaws. So we've talked about this uh, before, but I'll just give you a quick rundown of how this occurs, is when you eat the Western diet, you eat a diet high in animal foods. Animal foods are promoted because they're loaded with protein. Protein is a big sales pitch, even though there's never been a case of protein deficiency ever described. That's how they sell products to you. Well, proteins are made of amino acids. Okay, there, there are 20 different amino acids that make up all the proteins in nature. Now, the human being can make 12 of these amino acids, so they're, they're, they're the non-essential ones. You, we don't have to have those in the food, but eight of, them, eight of them we have to have in our food, so they're called essential. 
well, these amino acids, they're acids, acids. And the protein itself, when you, you know, look at the meat or the cheese or whatever, uh, and you say, take a pH stick and rub it over the surface of these particular animal foods, they, they actually test alkaline. It's only after the digestion of the protein, which occurs in the intestinal tract, that these proteins are broken down into amino acids. And animal foods have a very high content of sulfur-containing amino acids, cysteine and methionine, they're known as. And uh, these sulfur-containing amino acids, they break down into sulfuric acid. So you dump this huge acid load in the body. The primary buffering system of the, of the body is the bones. And the bones dissolve or release alkaline material. And that's the beginning of loss of bone material. Uh, more of it occurs, more of the mechanisms occur down at the kidney level. And it just, you end up urinating your bones in the toilet, including the bones in your mandible and maxilla. Uh, there's a lot of infection that occurs around the teeth from poor dental hygiene. And some of the, uh, the efforts of poor dental hygiene, some of the, it, the indications of it is when you go to the dental hygienist and the dental hygienist takes this little probe and sticks it between your teeth and your gums and calls out numbers like two, four, six, what the dental hygienist is talking about is the millimeters that are millimeters uh, that form the pockets. In other words, if you have big pockets between the gum and the teeth, you know, they go deep, six millimeters. You know, two millimeters is what they're supposed to be. Anyway, you get this, uh, this loss of attachment of the gingival tissues, the gums to the teeth, and you get an infection called gingivitis. And the gum disease may get so bad that the dentist, your dentist sends you off to the oral surgeon to have gum surgery. Well, let me hear, be here to tell you that most of you won't have to do that. As long as you start taking good care of your teeth and eating well. You know, the, the diet has a tremendously very important effect on the whole mouth, not just the teeth. And it's not just the sugar, it's the whole composition of the diet. You know, when you eat a diet for your kitty cats, which is what the American diet is, it's a carnivore diet, you end up uh, not supporting the health of the, of the mouth and teeth. You know? Anyway, uh, if, you will, if you will just be a little patient, change your diet and practice good dental hygiene. That means we've seen it, see in the hygienist. Uh, let the hygienist uh, clean some of these pockets out and uh, do daily cleaning between your teeth. Now, I know many of you like to floss. I, I've never enjoyed flossing, but I've discovered a, a more effective way to clean between the teeth. This is what I use, What I should encourage you to try. And these are intradental brushes. And they're little bottle brushes that you buy in the drugstore or on the internet, just little tiny brushes that you stick between your teeth and you will clean out a tremendous amount of particulate matter. In fact, more so than you'll ever get with flossing. And I think there's a reason why, and that is that flossing is not natural. Uh, think about it. You can even think about it, uh, our ancestors. Uh, they would gather around the, uh, the, the fire pit and uh, eat, eat their dinner together. And then they would leave after chewing on hopefully corn, and beans and rice, et cetera. And, and not, not, not the hunt. The hunt, of course, is an exaggeration. They didn't eat very many animal products, all these ancestors didn't. But on the way back to their, their hut from, from the community uh, fireplace is they had stuff between their teeth. And what, what did they find to pick up along the path to clean between their teeth? They didn't find floss. What they found is little sticks to poke between their teeth. That, that's, I think, is the natural way to clean between your teeth is little sticks like these interdental brushes that I told you about. Anyway, you can make a tremendous amount of improvement by, uh, by you know, seeing the dentist, seeing the dental hygienist and putting some good food in your mouth. Let's talk about uh, bad breath. Uh, there's advertisements on TV that I think we should pay attention to. Uh, this is for something called smart mouthwashes. And what they tell you is that all bad breath is caused by sulfur. Well, they're trying to sell a product that neutralizes the sulfur in your breath. And that's why they sell smart mouth, mouthwashes. It's because that's what this particular mouthwash does, it neutralizes sulfur. 
sulfur stinks. Uh, it is one of the more offensive smells that, uh, that uh, we're exposed to. You, you think about rotten eggs, that, they, that's sulfur. You think about the, uh, uh, about the uh, mud pits, you know, the, the, the boiling pits at Yosemite or, you know, or uh, Yellowstone National Park. And, you know, they, they're sulfur pits and they stink. Well, that, that's the most offensive odor that we are exposed to is this odor of sulfur. And uh, odor is very important as far as, uh, as far as our ability to communicate with other people. <clears throat> you know this because the perfume industry, that's, that's their business is to sell you different forms of odors that cover up the stink that people naturally have, primarily from the food they eat. Perfumes and deodorants and colognes and, you know, to cover up that foul smell, to cover up that sulfur. Well, the perfume industry knows that this has to do with romance. If you get the right smell, you know, you're attracted to other people, male or female. So uh, this is important to understand is that that the uh, reason that you are affected is because odor, which has come through here in the nose, it affects these little hairs here. These are actually little tiny nerves. And these are connected to a, 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 a part of the brain. This is not just a nerve. This is a part of the brain called the olfactory lobe. Okay, so you have direct connection with the air to these little hairs, these little nasal hairs. They go into nerve fibers, you can see them right here, the olfactory lobes, and then they up into this part of the brain, which is called the limbic system. This is called the limbic, this is where emotion occurs. This is where love and sexual attractiveness and hunger, and this is your limbic system. And so it connects your, what you smell connects directly to these kind of very personal sensations. And if you smell bad, smelling bad, like sulfur, that indicates that you're sick. And so odor is one way you decide who, what, what people you want around you. And when you're dealing with reproductive issues between a man and a woman, this odor helps you choose who you want to share your sperm or eggs with to produce the, 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 most, uh, the best offspring. That's, that's the importance there. And, and that's one of two ways that you can get clues of the health of a potential mate. The other is vision. You know, overweight people who look sickly, they're, they're not the ones that you choose to mate with. Likewise, people who smell like they're sick or dying, which you do smell like when you eat the Western diet, they're not the people that you, you wanna choose to mate with. But this extends into all kinds of other relationships, business relationship, um, you know, whether or not you get into school, what kind of grades you get into school would be your state of health as perceived by sight and smell. So you're trying to choose uh, in your community. You know, this is not, this is, they're not sexual relationships, they're platonic relationship. You're still trying to choose healthy people to work with, to go to school with, you know, and this is the way you choose these folks is by odor. All right, so you got that part, how important the smell is. The next question you have is, where does this stink come from? Where does this sulfur come from? Sulfur is an element that is neither created nor destroyed. Okay, you remain, remember that from your basic science. It's not created or destroyed. So it has to come from someplace. Well, where it comes from is the food. And if you compare the, the sulfur content of various foods, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. If you compare beef, same number of calories, same amount of protein, with pinto beans, Beef has four times more sulfur than just pinto beans. You compare eggs uh, to corn, four times as much sulfur. Cheddar cheese has five times as much sulfur as white potatoes and chicken seven times as much sulfur as rice. And tuna fish provides 12 times as much sulfur as sweet potatoes. So you can choose how much of this noxious odor you wanna have go into your body. And this, this determines how you smell from head to toe. Uh, you, you know, one of the places that we notice the odor is in bad breath. 
you think, well, you clean your mouth very carefully and you use the smart mouthwash and et cetera. You think you've solved the bad breath problem. You haven't. You haven't because these sulfur-containing foods are swallowed. They go through the intestinal tract. They're absorbed uh, through the intestinal tract into the bloodstream. The blood circulates back to the lungs. And with each breath, you exhale the smell. You can't get rid of it just by cleaning your mouth. You've got to stop the sulfur content of your whole body. And this sulfur, it circulates through the bloodstream after it enters through the intestinal tract and goes to your skin. It, is, it comes out on the surface of your skin. That's how you get body odor. And as we'll say for our discussion at the end is uh, these sulfur, these sulfur s- s- elements, they cause you to have bad farts, stink. Anyway, change your diet. All right, let's talk about another section of the upper intestinal tract. And let's talk about uh, after we left the mouth, uh, we enter something called the esophagus. The esophagus is this long tube that goes to the chest, all right? So the way you get the food through the chest cavity into the abdominal cavity is through this tube called the esophagus. And this esophagus, it attaches to the stomach. All right. There is a sphincter here called the lower esophageal sphincter. You probably learned about this because you've learned about GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. And you've learned that this uh, sphincter becomes incompetent. All right, in the next session we have, I'll tell you how it becomes competent, why it is incompetent. But between meals, what's supposed to happen is the muscular band here is supposed to contract and keep the, the stomach contents in the stomach. But what happens is this sphincter, it becomes incompetent. And as a result, the stomach contents, they reflux up into the esophagus. And it burns the esophagus, you get esophagitis. It burns it badly, you get, uh, you get uh, Barrett's esophagitis. And then through constant irritation, you may end up with one of the more untreatable cancers. They're all pretty much untreatable, but this is one of the really, really bad ones to get. It's called adenocarcinoma of esophagus. That's, that's a tough disease. Anyway, the, uh, the reflux continues uh, up into the lower soft jaw area all the way up and it refluxes back into the mouth. Okay, so when it refluxes the stomach contents full of acid, digestive substances, when it refluxes on your uh, larynx, which is an organ right here, you get hoarseness and you get a chronic cough. When this material gets refluxed up onto your teeth, you lose the enamel on your teeth and it gets refluxed up in your sinuses and it causes sinusitis. And when you breathe, you inhale the stomach contents down into your lungs and it gives you bronchitis, bronchoconstriction called asthma. And you know, almost all doctors know this, that, that um, asthma is caused, and a good share of people, if not almost all people, by this reflux problem. And, you know, doctors will give you advice on how to handle it. And one advice they should give is they should tell you to take advantage of gravity. So at night, when you lay down, you should have your, the head of your bed propped up. I don't mean bent, okay? I mean like that propped up. And what you do is you put a couple of four inch blocks under the, the two head posts that are in your bed and you raise yourself up so that gravity pulls pulls this, uh, this stuff that's being refluxed back into the stomach. So that's standard advice. Other advice is given for you to put on to, to consume antacids. And we'll get a chance to talk about that in a couple of minutes probably. But the main way, the main way that you can solve this problem is you can stop eating foods that are digested by all this acid. A cat has seven times as much concentration of acid in the cat's stomach as opposed to our stomach. Why? Because the cat's diet is meat, he's a carnivore. So when we eat meat, we draw upon the stomach to produce a lot more acid. So a way to get rid of this irritating component of the stomach juices is to stop eating the animal foods. Dairy, 
produces a tremendous amount of acid, not just because of the protein, but because of the calcium in dairy products. And so you stop the dairy and that stops the indigestion. I, I wanna just mention at this point, kind of a side note for you. And that is there are certain foods on our diet that cause intestinal distress, gastritis, maybe even esophagitis. And these are raw vegetables particularly onions, Greek peppers, cucumbers, and radishes, raw vegetables. And so if you're having problems with your stomach indigestion, esophagitis, et cetera, eat cooked food and stay away from onions, green peppers, cucumbers, and radishes, which by the way, once you cook them, they're not so irritating. I, I, I can remember seeing patients in the afternoon at our program in Santa Rosa, and we'd, we'd have on usually Tuesdays, we'd have burgers. Uh, burgers produced by Jeff Novick and ver burgers produced by Mary. It'd be a contest. They see who makes the best burger. But they would serve raw onions. And I loved raw onions, but boy, did they not love me. And so I'd spend the rest of the afternoon in distress trying to see my patients. Well, finally, I was able to communicate to the kitchen staff that they needed to cook the onions and then serve them as cooked onions. And when you heat the onions, whether you heat them by microwave, or by fry pan or boil them or whatever you do, you, uh, you cause a couple of volatile substances to be burnt off. And so they're no longer irritating. Anyway, so let's, let's uh, get back into the stomach here. Uh, in the stomach, you have uh, uh, the first part of digestion. Well, the first part of digestion actually starts with the saliva in your mouth with the amylases. Amylases are designed to digest starch. And uh, the next thing you go to is you go to the stomach fat, which is an acid in it, which digests protein. As I mentioned, it's not very good at digesting protein. It's not like your cat or carnivore. Well, there's a, a popular theory out there that it's not just a theory, it's, it's truth in medicine. The, the, the people who discovered it got the Nobel Prize for the discovery that uh, a lot of stomach problems, particularly ulcers and even some stomach cancers, require a bacterial infection called Helicobacteria pylori or H. pylori. And so uh, as a result, we, you know, scientists discovered that you have to have this bacterial infection to get this kind of gastritis and ulcers, et cetera. Well, you know, that led to a couple of things. One, the observation that H. pylori infection is almost universal around the world. And if you look at uh, less developed countries than the United States, essentially everybody's infected with this bacteria, but not everybody gets ulcers. In fact, the incidence of ulcers in these countries is little to none. You know, it requires an addition to this bacteria. It requires the wrong food for you to get the irritation to get to the point where you develop stomach ulcers. Now, the treatment in common practice is a, uh, they call it a triple therapy, where they give you two proton pump and oh, two antibiotics along with a proton pump inhibitor, and, and it does heal the ulcers. You know, the antibiotics kill the bacteria, and the uh, the proton pump inhibitor it cuts down on the acid, so they do heal the ulcers. And you take this therapy for about ten days, but guess what? You know, as long as you keep eating the same diet, what happens is the bacteria re regrow, they're all over in our environment. So you get reinfected. So the, the way you really fix the stomach is by changing the contents. You eat a starch-based diet that happens to have no animal products and no added oils, and then you've solved the problem. All right, so here we are in the stomach, okay? We're in the stomach right here. Larry and Louise are taking us through. And we go to the pylorus, which is the first part of the small intestine. And attached to that first part of the small intestine are a couple of ducts. You see them right here? Uh, there's the common bile duct. And then there's a duct that goes to the pancreas. The common bile duct, which is a heavier green one, it, it drains the liver. The liver is important because it's an organ that detoxifies, plus it makes bile acids. Now, once you remember this, the liver makes bile acids, we're gonna talk about it in our next discussion. The liver makes bile acids and the intention of the bile acids is to digest fat. That's what their purpose is, to digest fat. Well, so the liver makes these, uh, these bile acids where so they have a whole bunch of 
of uh, chemicals and stuff that have been removed by the filtering organ of the liver and the bile acids, which digest the fat. And they flow out of this kind of a tree here uh, into this common bile duct. And then they go into the intestine where the fat is because you just ate a high fat meal and they squirt all over the food. All right, but that, that's when you eat. When you eat, what happens is, is uh, the bile acids go in here, they go in here as a consequence, primarily of this sac, which stores the bile acids, squeezing, this is a gallbladder. So between meals, between meals, there's no need for any bile acid to be in the intestine, okay? So the little sphincter here is called the sphincter of Odi, closes down and the gallbladder relaxes. And then when we eat, particularly fatty foods, the gallbladder contracts and Odi opens up, all right. So the purpose of the gallbladder is to act as a storage organ for the bile acids that are made by the liver. But the storage organ, the gallbladder, it gets diseased. It gets uh, inflamed, irritated because of the unhealthy type of bile acids that are produced when you eat the rich Western diet. And it, uh, these, these uh, the, the bile acid fluid that's produced when you eat the Western diet is, uh, is super saturated with cholesterol. Again, every doctor knows this is the hallmark of forming gallstones is the fact that the bile is super saturated with cholesterol. Well, you know, cholesterol only comes from animal foods in any significant amount. So the reason you're super saturate your bile with cholesterol is because of the food Gallstones are made primarily by, with cholesterol. That's the primary component. And then these are the gallstones you get. How, how many people have gallstones? Well, uh, you know, 30, 40, 50% of people have gallstones when they get to be in their midlife. And, and we have an acronym that uh, we use in medicine, which was taught when I was a student. I'm still taught today. Who, who's more likely to get gallstones? Well, it's female fat, 40, and flatulent. That's the acronym. In other words, overweight women who, are, who eat the Western diet, female fat, 40, middle age, fertile, you know, that particular age group, they're, they're the ones that get the most of the gallstones, maybe half the population that is overweight female in the reproductive years, they, they, get, uh, they have gallstones present. All right, so the gallstones result in the removal, you just cut this little piece out here, which is the cystic duct. Okay, and now, now you no longer have a gallbladder to drain into the common duct that drains into the small intestine. Well, you know, once you get rid of the storage sac, then what happens is the bile drips continuously into the small intestine. I want you to remember that because we're gonna talk about that later on, next, next time we get together. Okay, you know, I have the storage sac, so the bile continues to drip here. And that causes irritation of the intestinal tract, as we're going to talk about, which results in di chronic diarrhea. And it also causes a, an increased risk of right-sided right colon cancer because these bile acids are irritating to the colon. And as a result of the irritation, you get more cancer. All right. So uh, let's just uh, talk a little bit more about this gallbladder thing. Uh, you, uh, about half of you will be found to have gallstones you'll have a sonogram done for some unrelated reason or an x-ray done and, or you'll have some stomach discomfort and the doctor will do a gallbladder test on you. And you'll find whether it's related to your gallbladder or not, you'll, you'll find that you have gallstones. What do you do about it? Well, this has been well studied. And what the studies consistently show is you're better off leaving the gallstones alone. If you decide to have, once you discover them, to have immediate surgery compared to those who delay surgery, those who have immediate surgery have a greater risk of dying and suffering from complications related to the surgery. So don't do it. Leave your gallstones where they are, as long as they don't hurt you. If they hurt you, the time on our treatment for gallbladder pain is a low fat diet. And it, almost always it goes away. The, the discomfort. And also what causes the gallstones in the first place is stopped. So your next question is, will these dissolve? Well, yes and no. 
there's a, a bile acid product called Actigol that you can take that dissolves the gallstones. But this is gone out of favor. It was very popular 20, 25 years ago. It's gone out of favor because once you treat people who have gallstones with Actigol and they disappeared, they came back. Well, why do you think they came back? It's because you're still eating the diet that super saturates the bile with cholesterol. So if you're gonna take that step to take Actigol, and I don't advise it, you gotta change your diet too, so you stop the reformation of the gallstones. Anyway, leave the gallstones alone, give, you the, give a medical student something to play with when they do their anatomy lessons. All right, we're gonna end here, we're gonna open up for questions and we'll invite Mary over to get involved and lighten up the conversation. But uh, next what happens is you go through the small intestine and the small intestine is very healthy. It, it's a place where everything's absorbed. All the vitamins, the minerals, the carbohydrates, the proteins, the fats, everything is absorbed in this uh, 28 feet of small intestine. And then what's left over, what's not absorbed goes into the large intestine, which is where we'll pick up our conversation the next time. Questions. I know that's yeah. more than you want to know about your bowels. No, we like to know about our bowels. Okay. <laughs> yes, I do see some questions posted in the chat. So guys, please put the four question marks because it helps. Okay. So Tammy says, I've had colon cancer twice and have about 16 inches of colon left. Yeah. How does that affect my absorption of nutrients? Well, the nice thing about the body is it has an ability to adapt. And once you've lost your colon, you know, you've lost some of it, not all of it. <clears throat> once you've lost your colon, what happens is the function of the colon is taken over by the last part of the small intestine. So it enlarges, it becomes colonized with bacteria and other microbes that are necessary for good health. So um, lo losing the colon is a big deal because the colon is as uh, important as the liver or kidneys. And what you hear an awful, awful lot about, and rightly so, is the, the bacteria and, and parasites and viruses, et cetera, that live in this large intestine. It's called the, the microbiome. It's getting a lot of attention these days. And this microbiome, it uh, finishes the digestion of the food, it produces uh, vitamins, uh, it communicates with your immune system and lets your immune system was, knows what's going on as far as threats from the environment. Uh, anyway, it's, it's, it's very important to have. So what happens if you've lost a significant amount of your large intestine, and I'm not sure you've lost enough for this to happen, but what will happen, say when you have a total colectomy, is you will colonize the, the last part of the small intestine and take over the function. All right, Mary, you wanna come over and say hello? Oh. How do you like this shirt I'm wearing today? I, I really like it. I think you look good in, in bright primary colors. Yeah, well, I want you to know this is a gift from Chef AJ. <laughs> when are you going to skip me a shirt? No, just um, I'll get you a shirt. <laughs> I'm teasing. Hi, Mary. How are you? Hi. Happy Memorial Day. Oh, happy Memorial Day. You're working all day. Yeah, yeah. yeah I got another show or two, but it's fun. I really love talking to people. Um, Dr. You do. McDougall, do you want only questions on GI or a couple? No, no, I'll questions? take okay. whatever, whatever people okay. have. I'm sure there's not a question. But I, before we start, I want you to know that Mary had trouble matching my shirt today. So she, this <laughs> I, is why she I just couldn't gone. find anything that would go in this nice bright orange. And so oh. I just thought, well, green will work okay. Yeah. <laughs> We're gonna, and I've got green tea. We're gonna have to yeah, start sending so Mary. Yeah. And we don't, we don't talk to each other before, guys. It just works out yeah. this way. Yeah. You know, Mary, Mary, you can pun intended weigh in on this question. Um, <laughs> how do we tell our loved ones that they are getting fat? Ooh, <laughs> you know, Dr. Lyle would say probably we shouldn't. I think. Well, yeah, but you know, you're concerned about them, so you want them to 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 pay attention to themselves, but. You know, I think probably a nice way of, of saying it would be to say, well, maybe we should go out for a walk today and get a little exercise. It'd probably be good for both of us. Um, or maybe you shouldn't be eating all that fat food, fatty food, because <laughs> the fat you eat, the fat you wear. Well, see, that's what he would say, but I would. Well, come on, you've got to give meaningful advice. Going for a walk is not going to cause this 
this well, man to get. Well, maybe they think about it. Well, they, that may be a place to start, but exercise is not going to cause you. Well, to maybe be... you could buy him a smaller size shirt and say, "Oh, I thought you were. Yeah, I thought you weighed less than you do." <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I've, but, I've given that hint to a few family members, haven't I? Yeah. Boy, your shirt's fitting a little tight today. Oh you know? boy. But, that, but I, they have to change. It's hard. They have change they, people have to want to change in order for them to do anything about it. So AJ, you attended a lecture, that, uh, uh, kind of a presentation I gave about three months ago, which was the truth, truth, the truth about health or something. Oh yeah, the real yeah. truth about health. And yeah, real, and so what did I say? How do you, how do you, how do you, how do you define obesity? What did I say to one of the oh, panel yeah. members? Take, take off you your clothes. Take your clothes off and look in the mirror. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I thought that was be uh, the the the, do the doctor who was promoting eating fish, which I strongly objected to because there's hardly <laughs> any fish left. He, he said the, the you know the secret to good health is to eat a lot of salmon. Well, I had no doubt that he ate a lot of salmon. The fat you eat, the fat you wear. And so somebody asked him to define obesity. He went into the BMI and that kind of stuff. And I said, well, one way you could do it is you take off your shirt and look in the mirror. <laughs> well, yeah, he didn't think the BMI um, was accurate or something like that. I don't that. know. I don't know. But, but I think that, you know, the mirror speaks a lot. So <laughs> maybe you ought to undress your husband and stick him in front of the mirror. Yeah, well, it's a very sensitive topic. And I, is, I have learned not to say anything, you know, unless your, Char your Charles is so trim and healthy. Oh my God, I know, but it's just, it's just, I think it, like Mary said, unless they want to change or they want your help, it's probably best to zip the lip. Probably. Yeah. So Jason <clears throat> watching live says Dr. Kempner had his patients on a 95% diet made of sugar, white rice, sugar, fruit, yeah. fruit juice. Did his patients have tooth decay from all that sugar in the diet? I mm. don't know. I don't know. But you know, it's a question I, I could probably ask because I, I still keep in contact with Francis Neal oh, yeah, and Robert Rosati who were, who worked you know side by side with him for 30 years. But that's a good question. I, I would certainly be concerned about it. Because, uh, but I guess the message I also like to give is it's more than sugar. It's the whole diet that makes a difference in the gums and the teeth and so on. It's just that sugar has been focused on and it makes sense because the bacteria that, uh, that destroy the enamel, the enamel on the teeth, uh, they, they like sugar. <laughs> has stayed on the rice diet like long term right oh, yeah, they have aj I, I met people who have been on it for 40 years <laughs> but they it, must it, have to have a vegetable now and then right well you know walter kempner loves some vegetables he, he only did this more strict uh approach when people started out when they remember he took care of people who had like 10 percent of their kidney function left 90 percent was gone they had, he had 10 10 percent of their heart function left 90 percent was gone so, you know, his approach was, how do I get this desperately ill person, people with what we call morbid hypertension, malignant hypertension, where it means they're about to have a stroke or heart failure, malignant. You know, how, how do I get these people out of trouble? And what he used is the diet as you describe it. But no, they were allowed some vegetables later on and probably even some animal products. Although I'm, I don't know that well, for sure. Didn't I, I? I mean, I know I've heard you call the Kempner diet as a diet for the nearly dead. Yeah, I do. I know. <laughs> and I use it with some. I, listen, I take care of people who are really sick. So I, once in a while, I would say, you know, maybe half a dozen times a year, I have to say, look, you, you need to do the Kempner approach. And, and uh, yeah, that's a lot for them to do. But, but considering the shape that they're in, you know, that's a lot for them to ask too. If you want to live a little longer to play with your grandkids and, you know, because life's terminal, you want to live a little longer and have a little more fun, chance to throw the ball back and forth. And, you know, you, you, this is what you do. You know, I didn't make the rules. Yeah. Walter Kepner did. Yeah. Do you notice that people just wait so long before changing their diet? Very few people do it before they get a disease. Yeah. I don't know. Well, I, I think I, I'm I'm afraid that's human nature. I mean, J John often talks about you know what is it going to take to get people to change the way they eat to to help save the planet. And I look at some of these people that that we see on TV, and they are just huge. And I say, you know, these people are never going to change. 
I mean, and it's sort of like um, what I said to you yesterday. Oh, Florida is going to have to be at least two feet underwater before people will decide, oh, I guess there's something wrong with the climate. Yeah, really. You know, and then, then it'll be like, oh, well, now it's too late. But, but Mary, you like when Dr. McDougall presented you with this information, you didn't have weight problems or probably even health problems. And you just did it. And it was the same with Charles. Like when he heard the doctor speak, he goes, oh, well, this makes sense. Why wouldn't I do it? Well, yeah, but there are a lot of people that are not like us that say, oh, yeah, this makes sense. So let's let's uh, let's do this. That there are people much more um, antagonistic, I would say, you know, um, I don't believe that shit. Yeah, but you know, <laughs> you know I'm, not, I'm not doing anything. You have to understand is that uh, a lot of people aren't lucky enough to have somebody like Charles and Mary around to help them. Yeah. You know, uh, or you and you helping Charles, and they, they don't have the information as part of the problem. But information is usually often not enough. Information is certainly important. Uh, the other thing is whether or not a person is going to change is their level of self worth. You know, people who like themselves, you know, make some changes. I think we've talked about this for you, for you too, AJ. You used to be a cigarette smoker, didn't you? Yeah, like in college. Oh, that was a mistake. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> I did too. I, I've got, you know, 20 pack years behind me. And it finally got to the point where I said, I don't want to be like this anymore. You know, I, I want to be, I want to be healthy. And I know what the problem is. And and it takes a high level of self-worth for you to decide you've had enough. And, uh, you know, that's basically the only appeal people that I can appeal to is people who like themselves. I, I said the rest of them to Doug Lyle. <laughs> thank, thank goodness for Dr. Doug yeah, Lyle. Yeah, really. Really, yeah, he's amazing. So uh, Nomad asks, <clears throat> is, if a person has gallstones, will changing to a whole food plant-based diet dissolve them or do we need Actigel to do that? And one thing yeah. I've noticed, Dr. McDougall, a lot of people, when they lose weight quickly, they seem to get gallstones. Have, that, have... That, is, that is true. And uh, let me explain to you why. Well, first of all, uh, as far as I know, Actigol, it's, it's a, uh, a composition of uh, bile acids but puts the bile acids in the gallbladder uh, in, a, in a favorable concentration to have them dissolve. That's all it is. It's just a mixture of bile acids that causes them to dissolve as opposed to solidify. And uh, you have to do the Actigol, uh, A-C-T-A-G-U-L, I believe. Okay, so you got to do that. And uh, as I mentioned, they come back because people keep eating the gallbladder forming diet. But they actually do go away if you take that drug? Uh-huh, they go away. Oh, yeah. Okay, and then if you didn't eat, then if you changed your diet, right, then you, they wouldn't come back. You, right, you wouldn't supersaturate the bile. So you'd be in a situation like, you know, you don't find gallstones in rural Africans or rural Asians. They, it's been non-existent before World War II. And now it's of course becoming a, an ep epidemic, pandemic disease, like it is among other Western eaters. And uh, yeah, you would, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't form in the first place, they wouldn't form in the second place. In other words, you got rid of them and then they, then they came back. What was the second part of the question? Um, or it would, can, can changing to a whole food plant-based diet yeah. dissolve gallstones or do we need the act again? Yeah, I was, I was thinking of something else. I was gonna continue this conversation. Oh, no, it wasn't a question. I had mentioned that I've noticed when people have lost oh, yeah. quickly, yeah. I, a lot of them develop gallstones. No, that's, that's, what, that's what I wanted to address. Yeah, when you lose weight for any reason, what happens is you mobilize your body fat. And uh, part of that mobilization involves mobilization of cholesterol. So essentially what you do is you're eating a big steak when you lose weight, that big steak being, you know, the, the fat, fat around your body. And that fat is loaded with uric acid, uh, loaded with cholesterol, loaded with, loaded with environmental contaminants, a uh, tremendous amount of poisoning. And uh, so what happens is the, the, for any, any reason of weight loss is, is people have a higher incidence of gallbladder attacks it's been known for 20 or 30 years. Now, I have to, in defense of what I do, and you can say, well, he's just being defensive, is I don't, I really haven't found any of our patients who uh, change their diet, lose massive amounts of weight, and develop a history of gallbladder disease. I just don't see it. And I have to believe it's because of the composition of the diet. 
In other words, they may be mobilizing cholesterol from their body fat, which is being eaten up, they're losing weight, but because the other, the rest they're of the not diet- not anymore. Yeah, the rest of the diet is so healthy, mm -hmm. no cholesterol, that they don't run into that situation where they have an increased risk of gallbladder disease. And like I say, I may be just, just being defensive, but I hope not. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, here is a question from Susan. What is your view of using diametaceous earth, fossil flour, and or activated charcoal to detox the digestive system? Well, as far as I remember, diatomaceous earth is contaminated with lead. You can correct me, but I'm, I'm thinking back something I wrote 30 years ago, but that would be an issue. But what, what do we use if we used it in Hawaii to keep the ants out, right? Oh yeah. yeah we used yeah. to put it around the doorways and stuff to keep the ants or the cockroaches or something. Yeah, they, still, they got rid of them. Yeah. So anyway, that, that's, that's what, that's what I recall. I and you can look it up, diatomaceous earth and lead. You, it'll, it'll tell you. But uh, what, were, what were the other things they wanted to detoxify their body with? Det uh, charcoal, activated charcoal. Okay, well, activated charcoal. Uh, Agatha Thrash, who's one of my heroes, one of my mentors. Uh, you can look her up. Agatha Thrash, amazing woman, ran Uchi Pines, which is a place similar to, you know, it's, it was a, a resort type clinic that does similar things to what we do, or Weimar does, or. It's like that place you go to in Mexico. Yeah. Well, except Uchi Pines was, I mean, they, they fed a very strict vegan diet. They used to, uh, Agatha used to recommend charcoal for all kinds of things, uh, mainly for indigestion, for detoxifying the body. Uh, it's used in emergency rooms every day around the world. Uh, when somebody comes in with, uh, with poisoning, is they give them, um, you know, a large amount of uh, activated charcoal to, to complex the poisons that they may have just taken. It saves lives. Standard practice. But then, don't I think I remember like from for years ago, you could, you told people they could take charcoal to lower their cholesterol too. Yeah, it does that lowers cholesterol too, right? Mm -hmm. I'm glad you're remembering those things, man. <laughs> See, but then the two of us will probably remember everything I ever knew. <laughs> um, anyway, the, um, yeah, it does. Because, well, you know, the reason I remember it is because I smelled it once and I thought I could never take that. Well, that's the problem. The problem is, is it's a black powder. And so what Agatha Thrash used to, to do is she used to put it in a, in a leftover, you know, a milk carton. So you couldn't see it. And she'd have people drink it through the straw. It doesn't, it's odorless and colorless and tasteless. Or not colorless, it's black. It's odorless and tasteless. And so she would uh, be able to get there, her patients to take activated charcoal by disguising it, hiding it in a milk carton. It's really tasteless. I think so. Oh, you, know, yeah. you don't like black stuff on your teeth when you look at it. Yeah, so I can't. Yeah, it should be should yeah. be odorless and tasteless. Not lookless, that's for sure. <laughs> and anyway, I I uh, I think there's a tremendous amount of value to activated charcoal for the things that she recommended, including detoxifying the body. And uh, the reason, the way I'd like you to detoxify your body is to put good things in. The bad stuff will come out if you put good stuff in. Uh, you know, I don't think you need any extra potions to, to clean the body out. Unless, of course, you had acute poisoning, you ended up in an emergency room dying, then charcoal would be good. <laughs> Otherwise, you got some time. You got some time. Do you, do you remember Daniel Vieira? Oh, yeah, Danny Vieira. Sure, very much so. He, he was on the show yesterday. He has a free conference. And he said you were one of the oh. speakers. He does something with, he was talking about act, some, some detox program he does. Uh with activated charcoal. Danny, when I knew Dan, Danny, is that he used to run a, a, a very Christian religious- Is that place in Lodi? Uh, yeah. Yeah, in Lodi, it's, it's not far from me now. Yes. Yeah, right, yeah. okay, we've been there a few times. Yeah, yeah, we used to go down and talk at his conference. There were a lot of very enthusiastic people that would be in a tent meeting. And so, you know- Oh yeah, it, it was like on a fairground. Yeah, you know, it's just like one of those revival tent meetings that yeah. Danny would- <laughs> And, and he, he used uh, basically the same principles that we use. And uh, I'm sure, I hope he still teaches a similar message. But he was a, he's, he's a good guy. I, I always liked Danny a lot. Oh, great. Well, yeah, he said to say hello. That's so fantastic. Oh. Um, Anna, who's watching live, says, I take care of teens, and it's so surprising to see how many have gallstones and fatty liver disease. Yeah. 
Do you have any advice how to address them, especially when parents are not on board or if the surgeons do not address diet? Yeah, well, it's 100% dietarily caused both. So, you know, if you, if you get, feed a high fat, high cholesterol diet, which is the animal food based diet that Americans have considered their birthright, to, their birthright is to kill anything that gets in their way and eat it, uh, then you're going to be sick because it's not the food for people. Well, and it would be difficult if their parents weren't on board. So, if you even if you had these teens in a, a home and, and you were trying to, you know, make their lives better and you feed them a great meal at lunchtime, they'd go home to all this junk in their home in the evening. And um, so I, I would be, you know, it'd be hard. I, I find, I find a, a lot of families that's working in the other direction. The kids come home and say, we're going vegan. Yeah. And mom and dad oh, say, okay. oh, okay, or no, I'm not going to do that or whatever. So uh, often these days, the, the children are bringing home the message to the rest of the family about a healthier diet. Could be the other way. But I think more commonly, it's, uh, it starts from the bottom up. And it should. I mean, the, the young people <laughs> need to be out in the streets. They need to be marching in the streets right now because of global warming. You go, you, we need a wake up call. We need, we, without being a, a, a disaster, you know, people have to become aware of just what peril we're in. I know I'm losing, I'm losing your audience. You don't want to hear this. <laughs> God, I know you don't want to hear it, but ladies and gentlemen, we're cooked. And one way to save ourselves is to switch the planet to a, a vegan diet. I wouldn't keep talking about this if I didn't think there was some way to fix it. But we got to move soon, like now. And you know, the the I listened to a lecture yesterday. The elites, the bankers, the people who are wealthy, you know, they're the ones that are hindering the change, or they could bring the change from the top, and they don't. And my question was, don't they have children too? Don't they have grandchildren too? Do you think that they're going to escape what's going on? You know, we need to get the people on the top to move. And what you do that is you get the people on the bottom to protest. God, I tell you, I, I, I would be out in the streets with them. But we need, it's just, it's just, uh, it's sad. Let's get on to another. Let's talk about the balls. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Sherry's asking, how do you feel about salt-free fermented foods? I guess there's some help for the GI system with fermented foods, supposedly. Uh, I, 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 I can't relate to the question. Like maybe uh, uh, tempeh fermented, uh, well, sauerkraut, sauerkraut fermented, fermented. Um, kimchi is fermented. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Uh, again, if you I put, know the Seventh Day Adventists don't believe in fermented foods, right? Yeah, because of the vinegar and and things like that. But right, yep. yeah. Yeah, I, I was accepted into the Adventist community back in 1986 when they invited me to leave Hawaii. Well, even before that, I used to work at Castle Hospital, which was an Adventist hospital in Kailua, Oahu. And so this is a good place to work, somebody interested in food because the Adventists are very interested in food. But uh, uh, the St. Helena Hospital, which is in the Napa Valley, invited Mary and I and the family to move back in, well, we started moving in 86, finished in 1987. And uh, I started running my program at St. Lena Hospital. There, there's, there's a mixed bag for you, the Adventist <laughs> population. You know, they, uh, they've kept a lot of their good, clean habits, like smoking and drinking. I think very few of them do either of that. But the, the, as far as their acceptance of the Western diet, which was contrary to what Ellen White taught them and still, still teaches them with her writings, you know, they've really blown it. Half the Adventists are meat eaters and those that are quote vegetarians are heavy into into loma linda greasy foods morning star foods so they're eating a greasy vegan diet and they're you know many of them are into eggs and eggs and dairy uh, you know they they, they miss the, the teachings of ellen white well and they like all the new meat substitute yeah. substitutes that are on the market because that's what they they grew up eating the loma linda had sausages in a can i remember you could, they had, um, uh, like Morningstar. Well, I don't know if it was, more, yeah. no, it was, they were Loma Linda brand, but the, they, even in the um, basements of Seventh-day Adventist churches, oh, yeah, they had little stores. 
Yeah. Where they would sell these fake meat products. And, right. And do, do you remember getting kicked out of uh, out of some of the camp meetings? Not being invited back. I, I, um, sure no, I know we used to go to a lot of them. I don't remember why they didn't invite yeah. us back because well, we were too strict, I think. We are, we are not Seventh-day Adventists. Know nothing about their religion, but because of our interest in a healthy diet, which is a principle of the Adventists, they're, they're, they preach vegetarian and veganism. At least they do at one level. When it interferes with their pocketbooks, they stop preaching it. <laughs> and I do mean that. <clears throat> we used to go, we used to be invited to camp meetings where there'd be like, you know, 500, maybe more people that would attend the lectures that Mary and I gave. And uh, I, they would ask me, they would ask me about Morning Star and, and uh, what was the other one, Loma Linda? Loma Linda, Loma, yeah. What I, what I thought about their meat substitutes and I told them, they're dangerous. <laughs> and they stopped inviting me to the camp meetings. <laughs> You know, well, we went for like three or four years. Oh, yeah, we did. We talked, probably talked to a dozen, met some really, really nice people. But I think it was mainly because of your association with the hospital, because I remember doing this at first when we first moved there. Yeah, we did it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, maybe, yeah, probably. But we were in California and we did it. Yeah, and our kids were young and they used to go and help us. It's the same thing with the hospitals that I worked at, Castle Hospital and uh, San Alita Hospital. It was fine to put these types of... Uh, mission statements up on the wall, you know, that we're going to be concerned about the, the, the diet and lifestyle of our fellow Americans. They put it, put it right there, right there, the mission statement on the wall. But as far as practicing it, they could, this is getting in the way of the cath lab. You know, this is 80% of our business is heart disease. What do you want to do? Ruin our business? We'll have to close the doors. That's what they told me. I left. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I'll tell you, I had some interesting times. I worked for 16 years at that, at St. Lynn Hospital in the Napa Valley, and I spent another 10 years working at Castle Hospital, about 10 years. So, so I, I have a long, long time association with the Adventist community. And I want to tell you, they have some good principles. Just don't let it get in the way of their money. Well, Castle Hospital actually had a... Um, a great cafeteria oh, yeah. that served McDougal food. That's right. You could come from all over Oahu. Yeah. I think they still do, Mary. Really? Yeah. You come from all over Oahu and you just tell me about the McDougal entree. And St. Lena never did that. Uh, it got to the point at St. Lena Hospital where they would allow our diet to be served in the hospital section. There was a while there when they wouldn't let them order McDougal food if they came in for a heart attack or whatever. But they finally got around to allowing people who are dying of heart disease to eat other than the food that caused them to die of heart disease. And by the way, <laughs> the St. Lena Hospital, they served meat. They served meat above the second floor. Why? Because they had to compete with Queen of the Valley, which is the hospital down the street. They had to compete with them for heart, heart, heart businesses. And so they weren't going to lose the money. You know, principle only goes so far, folks. When it, when it, when it, uh, it has to do with your pocketbook, you know, then we'll think again. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> hey, we got a question on burping from Cindy. She has, tr uh, Cindy has trouble with it. Any advice on how to reduce it? Burping? Mm -hmm. Burping is, uh, is a sign of irritation of the stomach and esophagus. So I would start by putting non-irritating foods in. And, you know, that, that would be the first stop. Would it be non-irritating foods? Well, it's a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables, avoiding raw vegetables. Well, even um, carbonated water yeah, for some no, people. Yeah, carbonated water would be good. Causes, causes burping. You know, just could get the gas <clears throat> to come out from the carbonated. Coffee would be another one that may be troublesome to people. Any serious coffee drinker carries around a uh, a, a bottle of antacids because they have a chronic indigestion from the coffee. And it, by the way, it's not from the caffeine, it's from the other alkaloids in coffee because you get as much acid secretion and indigestion drink, drinking decaf as opposed to regular, compared to regular coffee, you get even more indigestion with decaf. Wow, that's interesting. I don't think people know that. No, you know, they, they make a good decision, but the caffeine is very disturbing for a lot of us. And, um, uh, so, you know, we know well enough to get uh, to decaf, but then we expect other problems such as uh, raising cholesterol. 
uh, decaf coffee raises cholesterol more than does regular coffee. And decaf coffee causes as much, if not more acid secretion and indigestion as regular coffee. It's because there are other substances, we call them alkaloids, besides the caffeine that are present in these bean pods. And they have, they have effects also. Who knew? That's very helpful. <laughs> Thank you. I had yeah. no idea. Uh, Karen says, what causes hiatal hernia and how do you keep protected from future damage? Uh, well, that's going to be the next lecture. But you I'll didn't get that far today? No, I only got to the, I only got to the end of the stomach. Oh, I, okay. I got to the gall there. A hiatal hernia is caused by chronic constipation. And uh, the grunting and groaning is strained to move the rock hard fecal marble known as the American stool. And uh, what happens is you push up, push your stomach up into your chest, dilates the, uh, the normal opening in the diaphragm. And a hernia means a dilated muscle, you know, like a hernia in your groin or a hernia on your abdomen. A hernia means that the muscle's gotten stretched out. So the diaphragm's a muscle and through that muscle passes the esophagus. And by you know, grunting and groaning and straining, you push the stomach up into the chest and you open the muscle. In other words, you create a high, you create a higher, high, high, thanks for, <laughs> you create a high uh, hernia, that's what you do. And th then what happens is the stomach lies up in the chest <clears throat> and with each and every breath that you take, you suck stomach acids up into the, uh, into the esophagus. And the way you fix it is you don't. A surgeon will fix it for you. They'll drag the stomach back down, sew up the hernia, just like they do the hernia that's in your groin. They'll fix it for you. I, I recommend you don't do it. You don't need to put yourself through that kind of risk or pain because if you just change your diet, you, you'll stop getting the reflux in almost every case. Just, just change your diet. You know, Do the other things I talked to you about, raise the head of your bed. Most times people with hiatus hernias, they notice most of the irritation is when they bend over or they're laying down at night. And so you correct that by raising the head of your bed at night and you be careful about bending forward and bending over and pushing that acid up into your esophagus. That's what you do. <laughs> nice, thank you. Uh, Kathy says, would it be more important to eat prebiotics if your colon is shortened to feed the bacteria in your colon? Well, I would say definitely prebiotics in the form of rice, corn, potatoes, sweet potatoes. That's all pre prebiotics are. They're just sugars. They're just starch sugars. Why would you want to go buy them when you get them cheaply from rice and corn and beans? And there's your prebiotics. Because That's they're advertised and people are making money off them. And so they're advertised as something. Oh, you're so cynical. <laughs> Well, I'm right. You're right. You're right. It's another product to buy. This is like probiotics. Probiotics are very little help because what bacteria live in your intestine depend on what you feed it. So if you're going to feed the bacteria animal foods, you know, meats, dairy, and so on, you're going to grow bad bacteria. You're going to want to grow bacteria that convert uh, some of the food into cancer causing chemicals. You know, you, you don't, you want to, you have to take good care of your bacteria, feed them a lot of prebiotics, which are sugars found in starches. You don't have to go and buy the, the, the little vials of prebiotics. They're just starch sugars. Great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Gunther says, do carrots contribute to maintaining one's eyesight and maybe even improving it like potatoes? <laughs> Well, I did a whole lecture on that, which was a discussion between Dr. Greger and myself. So I'd ask you to look that up. Uh, just put in YouTube, uh, McDougall and Greger. And it came out of a, 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 a forum that he had about potatoes. And he was maligning the potato. And somebody asked him about the McDougall diet. And he said the McDougall diet was dangerous. But he didn't talk about carrots, did you? Talk about night blindness. Okay. Which is what he'd ask about. Uh, carrots provide a lot of uh, carotenoids, uh, beta carotenoids, and, co and colorful vegetables do. And what Dr. Greger was referring to was that uh, if you eat, follow Dr. McDougall's advice to eat white potatoes, you'll go blind. 
Well, the truth of the matter is you might develop night blindness, but you don't. And I showed <laughs> that you don't. There's plenty of beta carotene in white potatoes. Uh, my dad was a pilot in World War II. And because night vision was really important for these pilots, they ate carrots to the point where they turned orange. It's called keratinemia, not toxic at all. You just take on an orange color. But that's what the pilots during World War II did is they ate carrots with the belief that it would improve their night sight. It was based on the fact that you can get night blindness if you have a deficient diet. But I mean, it really has to be deficient, not just eating white potatoes. It has to be a diet that, that is uh, you know, insufficient in quality and quantity. Uh, these, this occurs in people with infections, sick people who are malnourished. Not, not in any, anybody who's healthy. Anyway, you'll enjoy this discussion between Dr. Gray. No, it was one-sided. I couldn't get him to discuss it. <laughs> and, uh, but it all relates to the carrot and your question, which is, do you have to eat carrots to make your night vision better? No, I don't, because you won't suffer from night vision problems if you don't. Did you? I mean, do you have night vision problems? Do you have night blindness? Night blindness is when you walk into a theater or a dark room and you have trouble seeing things right away. It's not when you're trying to read, okay? Uh, that, that visual acuity is of course the kind that's most important to you. You gotta drive a car, you gotta thread a needle, you gotta read and so on. Uh, you don't, you know, even if not, you have no night blindness that occurs because you're infected and you have terribly malnourished, you still have that acute vision. You, you just have trouble when you walk into a dark room. So do, I ask you, do any of you have night blindness? I don't think so. Do all wait, any wait, of you? Wait, wait, does it mean you can't see anything or does no, no, it come you, back? No, you, you can see. It's just, it just looks, looks a little darker. Oh, okay. You, know, you can see. I mean, you'll be able to find your theater seat. It's just that you'll, you'll have, uh, it's only, it only noticeable when you walk into a dark room. So uh, anyway, um, none of you, probably none of you eat carrots to the point where you turn orange. And none of you have mm -hmm. night blindness. So just, well, I remember we knew someone who ate, who ate that many carrots. We did? Yeah, I remember Jan. Of Ryan Jan? Uh -huh. oh, I, yeah, yeah, okay, I guess so. These, these are a couple of hippies that owned a, uh, a natural food store across from my office in Kailua. Good friends of ours. And uh, she ate so many carrots that she turned to orange. I do I mean, remember the now. The palms of her hands. Hey, look at this. Like, yes, my well, orange shirt. Was, they were I was going to say, you ate so many, your shirt turned <laughs> they were, orange. My shirt they turned were orange. At least that orange. No, you, you, you need to eat a starch based diet, you know. There's nothing wrong with eating a colorful diet, but for somebody to tell you you're going to go blind if you don't eat a colorful diet, that's just wrong. Anybody who maligns my potato is going to get my full <laughs> wrath, I'll tell you. That's funny. Thank you. Okay. Susan, Susanna says, I've been eating this way a year and a half. I'm 55 year old mid menopausal woman down 57 pounds, but my healthy gums are suddenly receding quickly. Do you have any suggestions? No, I, I, I would see your dentist, see your dental hygienist. Uh, when you get older, this is, you know, you become long in the tooth. Yeah, it's really important to floss properly. And, you say and so, clean, you like clean to floss. I hate flossing. Well, no, you, but you clean between your teeth with those dental brushes, um, yeah. dental brushes inner mm -hmm. dental brushes, that's the same Se thing. Several times a day. Yeah, you gotta, you've got to have good, good dental hygiene and you've got to eat a good diet. And it's, it's more than just brushing your teeth. You have to take care of in between your teeth and down by the gum line and things like that. You can't just brush your teeth like that. And you. the fact that you lost 56 pounds, I'm assuming you did that by eating a lot of good food and not by starving you know, or by eating worse yet, eating the Atkins diet. That, that, would, that would give you gum and tooth disease. So, or malnourishment would give you all kinds of problems. So hopefully you did it by eating a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. Yeah, no, she did. She she did. She's doing great. I, I I cannot offer you. I've never, you know, I just, I see as people get older, they get long in the tooth. I guess yeah. we can talk about old age now, can't we, Mary? Yeah, we can. All right. <laughs> You're an expert at it. <laughs> right. We've now entered, we've now entered that, that particular phase of our life. And fortunately, I have to tell you, for those of you who are still about to embark upon this, they really are the golden years particularly if you have somebody like, uh, like Mary to live with. 
that's been just, <laughs> our lives have changed so much. Uh, but, you know, it's been 50 years. We've done a lot of things, lived a lot of different roles from lovers to parents and we're still lovers, <laughs> so to speak. Ah, oh, that's beautiful. Okay. Can, uh, Sage says, can PVCs go away after losing weight? Uh, probably, possibly, uh, you know, they, there's some evidence that PVCs get better when you eat a healthier diet for a couple of reasons. One is PVCs might be due to uh, a relative hypoxia that occurs from eating fat. You know, I've shown you how we eat a high fat diet. You drop, drop your oxygen tension by 20%. And uh, if you eat a healthy diet, low fat, you increase the oxygen flow to your tissues by 20%. And PVCs are due to a relative hypoxia. There's a little, little low oxygen tension, that's one cause. So that would help also, you know, adding some more essential plant fats might help too. It might stabilize the membranes. There's some evidence to that, but you don't wanna stabilize the membranes by taking DHA and EPA supplements. You know, taking these concentrated oils out of the food is not a good thing to do. You need to eat your, your uh, alpha-linolenic acid, ALA, with plants. Uh, alpha-linolenic acid is the, is the precursor to all essential fats. They're, it's only made by plants. So what happens is uh, ALA, alpha-linolenic acid, is converted into DHA and EPA and all of the other essential fats down the line. We have the ability to do that. We just don't have the ability to desaturate the initial carbon chain at the three position. I'm sure that made a sense to all a lot of you. <laughs> doesn't matter, it don't work. I was gonna tell you, it's just, you're, being, you're being poisoned by buying this garbage. I mean, I've been listening to that for 50 years and it still doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> well, we'll sit down, I'll draw you the carbon chain. I know, you I know see, what the carbon chain looks like. The, the carbon chain at, at the third carbon, what happens is the body has the ability to remove two hydrogens and create a double bond, but only plants can do that. Animals can't. They can't produce a double bond at the sixth position either, which are the two essential fats. Why? Um, it's the way God made it, I don't know. <laughs> okay. You know, <laughs> why, why don't plant? Why don't animals have flowers? I don't know. <laughs> why, why don't plants have feet? I don't know. <laughs> okay, fair. That's mm -hmm. funny. Okay, Tammy says, how long does it take to remove the fat from your liver after eating a whole food plant based uh, diet? It goes away as, just as fast as the body fat does. Okay. See, okay. this is just one more area the body is storing fat. So when you see it leave your hips and your thighs and your abdomen. It's leaving, your, it's leaving your liver too. What, what happens is the liver, when it gets full of fat, it gets irritated. And that irritation leads to cirrhosis. And I hear, I read, I've never seen it, that uh, people who have fatty livers, which is I mean, it's the number one cause of liver disease in people today, is fatty liver. And uh, that irritation, they say, can get so bad that you can develop cirrhosis, which is a deadly condition usually associated just with alcoholism. I don't know if that's the case, but I've sure seen a lot of people with elevated liver enzymes. And a few of them have gone on to, to having a sonogram done, which shows the fat in their liver. But you, you don't need to, you just look, take off your clothes and look in the mirror. <laughs> you, 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 you'll tell when the, when the liver gets cleared of fat, look in the, look, take off your clothes and look in the mirror. What do you see? Yep. There's a person asking about licorice root. I don't know if you know anything about yeah, that. Yeah, I know a little bit about it. Yeah, diglycerated licorice is used to treat ulcers and indigestion. I used to have a sponsor of my radio show, which would uh, advertise diglycerated licorice. And I think it does. I mean, from what I studied back then and looked up is, yeah, it does. It relieves indigestion and it- uh, Still around? Yeah, oh yeah, you, you can find it. Where, where would you buy something like that? On the internet, oh. probably Amazon. <laughs> it's, it's, it's easy to find. It just look up licorice or D-I-G-L-Y-C-E-R. D -D I don't know, it's been a long time. Anyway, I used to have a sponsor on my show. I, I had a radio show that played, it played all over the West Coast. I was on the biggest, in the biggest stations 
KABC in Los Angeles, KSDO in San Diego, you know, KPIX in, in uh, San Francisco. I was, I was on, up in Spokane. I was all over the West Coast. We used to get 2,000 phone calls a night. Yeah, it was a very wow. popular show. And, I, and I, I had this show for about five years until one day I came into work and I started seeing one radio station after another cancel me after five years. Within three weeks, I lost all the shows. Why do you think that happened? Somebody, somebody started listening to what my show and said, this is not sponsor friendly. We got to get rid of this guy. And so they got rid of me. But it didn't change, didn't change the influence I made in, on the West Coast. A lot of people heard my message. Yeah. Do you ever want another radio show? You know, if I did, I would probably start a podcast like you. But no, I leave it to other talented people like you, AJ. Okay. No, I, I don't think so. I, I, that was a lot of work. Uh, but, you know, back then it was before we had the internet and before we had podcasts. So that was the way. Mm -hmm. I used to think talk radio would save the world. You know, just <laughs> like now I feel every once in a while that the internet will save the world. But talk radio, once it was bought up, it was bought up by by three large conglomerates, every station across the country. And all of a sudden, independent opinion, opinions disappeared. These three, three big networks uh, bought all, all the shows up. And that happened about 20 years ago. And you know, that's when I, 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 would, I would do, I, I had, uh, I, anyway, I was all over the North Bay every day, six out of seven days a week, I was played in the North Bay all the way well, all the way from the South Bay up to who knows where up north. We broadcast from Santa Rosa. <clears throat> and uh, I was also on uh, KSTE, which is the big station in, in Sacramento. I was on there for five years every day. In fact, if you go to my website, you look up some of the things we talked about, like the interview I did with Carl Lewis, you know, the fastest man in the world. He's, it was an hour interview with him on my website if you want to listen to the fastest man in the world and how I got to be that way by eating, eating the McDougal diet he'll tell you mm -hmm. well that that show I did from K, uh, KST it was called KST then or KSTE now it's called I did from them their studios and we recorded Carl Lewis he's there anyway I, I had a lot of radio shows AJ I liked it I got a chance to talk to a lot of people Mary and I traveled all over the west coast in fact we traveled in the in the midwest giving um, seminars we'd have 100 300 500 people show up for a, a one day event that we we would hold at different hotels around around the country nice just want to read this nice comment from a live viewer can you please pass along to dr mcdougall that this is my 12 months on the start solution i've gone from <laughs> 50 inch pant size down to 38 i'm uh -huh. 61 and feel great thank you wow you know it's 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 so simple uh, you it's just a shame it doesn't have any money behind it, AJ. Uh, same thing with the, the, the planetary destruction that's going on now. It was a, somebody, somebody's financial advantage to keep human beings on this planet, along with spiders and snakes and tigers and lions. They're all going to. If somebody could figure out a way to make a buck doing it, they'd probably save this place. But they can't, so they don't. Hey, you know, I used to think uh, when I first discovered this, I was, uh, you know, I was a sugar plantation doctor. I told you this and I studied the literature afterwards when I came back to do my residency. I used to think there'd be a line <laughs> all the way from my office door to the Honolulu airport get, waiting to get in to see me. Boy, was I wrong. You know, it's been a struggle here. I, here I am, you know, 46 years later still trying to get the audience that we deserve. You know, we have a population just in this country of 330 million people and they're all sick. 80% of them are overweight or obese. Half are pre-diabetic. They all need us. When are they going to discover us? <laughs> anyway, I put about as much hope in saving Earth. And believe me, if you don't think it's that serious what I'm saying, it, just pay attention and saving earth. And I've gotten uh, the response as far as saving the individual. It's been tough sell. Why? Because 
Some somebody's not making money. That's all people care about is making money. Even if they have kids and grandkids, I ask him, don't these bankers, don't don't these these people running the fossil fuel industry, you know, don't 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 they have kids and grandkids? Or don't they have any humanity? This is a moral issue. What's going on? Yeah, well, I feel your passion, and I wish I could help. Yeah, well, you are helping, AJ. You're helping with <laughs> every day when you have these great guests on. And uh, the more you can get them to talk about uh, climate, uh, I think the better. It's a tough sell. You know, I've, I've tried to get on some pretty big um, podcasts, getting people interested in hearing about what's going on with the planet. And the fact, you know, I wouldn't even talk about this if we couldn't reduce the output of global warming gases by 80% overnight, if people would switch from the Western diet to a vegan diet or what I prefer to call a, tra a traditional diet, 80% reduction in carbon dioxide output. It's the greatest decarbonizer available to get carbon out of the atmosphere is the switch in diet. Nobody wants to hear that. Oh, they will someday, but you know, that day may be way too late. Just like, just like over the last 46 years, uh, I've seen the population go from where 17% uh, of the adults were obese to where today 40% uh, are obese. And the prediction is that 70 to 80%, and we're not talking about just overweight. We're talking about obese, that 70 to 80% of people will be obese in the Southeast United States. You know, down there where they have all that uh, Kentucky fried chicken. <laughs> um, hey, listen, you just look around. The fat you eat the fat you wear. You couldn't get that fat without the fat and the food. I don't care how much you ate. I don't care how many potatoes you ate. And of course, you know that's not true. You know that potatoes make you thin. It's the grease. It's the oil. It's the storage of the fat in your fatty tissues waiting for the day when no food's available. Maybe that's what everybody's waiting for, to decide that they're gonna save the planet. Maybe they're waiting till they burn up all the <laughs> they, fat they, they, store it, they store it. Oh, I got a hundred pounds of fat stored. I can last, I can last, let's see, I can last another four months. The planet will be mine. I'll be the only person left. Look at all the fat I've accumulated up. Everybody else will be dead from starvation. We should probably end this show. Probably. Anyway, that's what happens when you have a wild mind. A, a wild mind get old, <laughs> especially with one that suffered a stroke at a young age. Mm. Just, just can't control. So Stephanie, who's watching live, says, "What if the McDougal diet doesn't work for someone with Crohn's disease?" Well, then, then the next step would be to go on a gluten-free diet. And by the way, this is discussed in my May 2014 newsletter. So you go on a gluten-free diet because that's part of the autoimmune disease picture. And by the way, you can listen to the lecture that I gave on Chef AJ's show about four months ago on autoimmune diseases and diet. And you get the whole picture there. It takes you an hour to go through that. You can find it on YouTube. Just look up McDougal and autoimmune diseases. And then the next step that you take is you take you go on an elimination diet. And that, that's almost always solves the problem. If you don't get it solved there, then what I do is I send you off to Goldhammer. <laughs> Alan Goldhammer is the, he's been a friend for 40 years. And they, they uh, run a fasting uh, uh, place, you know, where you go and very nice. You've been, uh, a lot of people have been there. You know, I know some of you folks have been there. And it, it's a nice hotel type setting. And, and uh, they really take good care of you. They got great doctors and they'll feed you the ultimate in an elimination diet. All you get is water. And that's why we could never compete with uh, old uh, Goldhammer is because his overhead was so much lower than ours. <laughs> so all he fed him was water. Anyway, that, that's your last chance. Believe me, if it doesn't solve your problem, then uh, we can't fix it uh, because you've eliminated everything in the environment that we could possibly eliminate. And by the way, I find very few people need the extra step of fasting, water fasting. Occasionally, yeah, but very few. Most of them can handle it by doing the elimination diet. 
my May 2014 newsletter. Towards the end of the newsletter, by the way, if you get impatient reading through it. <laughs> right. Well, great. I want to thank Aunt Days and Becky for their super chat donations. And she has a question. So what do you do if you are extremely obese, losing weight on your plan, but don't have a gallbladder? Is that cholesterol going to cause damage leaving the body? Well, you know, that's an argument, AJ, that people ought to at least pay attention to. It particularly comes up when mothers uh, or potential mothers are overweight and they decide to lose weight. And all, this all these chemicals, you know, poisons, methylmercury, all kinds of chemicals that are stored in their body fat uh, are released as they lose weight. And the concern they have is, will I poison my baby? You know, that, that, that's growing in my uterus. Yeah, probably will. But is it worth, worth it to lose the weight, to have a healthy offspring and, and, and a healthy pregnancy? Absolutely. So just because all these poisons are being mobilized out of your body fat is no reason to hesitate starting a healthy diet. And whether you have a gallbladder or not, it doesn't make any difference. You, you, is that in that fat is stored cholesterol, uric acid, methylmercury, you know, lead, uh, maybe not lead. Anyway, okay, whatever. Uh, organophosphates, pesticides, for sure. It, it's these things are all fat soluble. So in that in that fat cell, by the way, you're born with a certain number of fat cells, and that doesn't change. Just they get fatter. <laughs> so you know, yeah, they're not working that okay. They get fatter, and so they store more more stuff. So your question is a good one, but uh, I, I you know get on with losing the, all that poison you've stored up. And now's the time to do it. The, body, the, the food is so supportive of health that you run virtually no risk of doing anything but getting healthier. I, I've been I've taking care of like 12,000 people doing this. And I have not yet seen anybody fail to get healthier when they got off the Western diet and started a starch-based diet. I've never seen it. It's like, it's like have, you, have you ever seen anybody quit smoking cigarettes and get worse? Or have you ever seen somebody quit alcohol and fall down and hurt themselves more? My, my mother used to tell me that. She used to say, she, I got to put this in reference. You know, I'm a doctor. My brother's a board certified internist. My sister's a nurse. Her husband's a, a board certified occupational therapist. And all of us used to get after her. Oh, we would get after her about her cigarette smoking. She smoked more smoke from the time she was 25 till she was 83. And she died at, uh, what, 93? Was she 93? Yeah, I think so. Anyway, she, she had terrible lung disease too, but she still made it. But she used to say to us kids, you know, you want me to quit smoking? You know, if I quit smoking, I get so nervous, I get in a car accident, some car accident and kill myself. You want me to kill myself? <laughs> It's amazing the way people support their bad habits. And mother was the same way. And I can't say that I don't know anybody who doesn't act that way. We're de very defensive about our own behaviors. Yeah. Oh, Janet says she just discovered an umbilical hernia. Is it okay to leave it alone? Absolutely. You should almost never have an umbilical hernia unless, unless you're going to do, the, you're going to do a, a swimsuit contest then you should probably have it fixed. But otherwise, just leave it alone. Now, the bottle is not gonna get strangulated in it. It's just gonna be a little, little pouch that comes out around your belly button because the belly button is, is where, you know, where your circulation and everything connected you to the placenta. Okay, that, that's the umbilical cord and that, that entered your body and that had to go through the, a muscular wall. And most of the time it heals just fine. And very few of us end up with umbilical hernias, but through grunting and groaning and straining, probably related to constipation too. And you end up pushing this little guy out and now you have a little hernia, but uh, as I say, they don't get strangulated. There's no reason to operate on them except for cosmetic reasons. Great, thanks. Um, here's a question from Laura. Would someone on SSRI medication need physician monitoring to start the starch solution in order to ease off this drug? Well, you asked two questions there. Uh, is, is somebody on, uh, on uh, SSRIs, which are, think of some for me, Mary. Antidepressants? I, 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 I'm trying to think of some yeah. of the comments. Prozac, Prozac, et cetera. Uh, would they need to... Uh, 
to wean off or get off the SSRIs before starting the diet? Or the answer is no. Or would they, uh, would the diet make it easier to get off the SSRIs? No. no. <laughs> Should you be careful about getting off these antidepressants? Yes, because you're dependent on them and you could go through serious withdrawal. So I would be very careful. I, I don't know whether doctor's supervision is going to help you or not, but of course, you know, I'm going to advise it for you. But it has nothing to do with the food. No, it has nothing to do with the food. You can still eat a healthy diet and take SSRIs, Absolutely. but you're going to need help to get off the SSRIs. Yeah, because you become dependent on them and you have terrible withdrawal. Yeah, so, Dr. Lyle can maybe help with that. Yeah, you know, there's a... Um, Anatomy of an illness. Do you remember the guy? Anatomy of an epidemic. Robert Ep Whitaker. Great. Yeah, Robert Whitaker. He, he, gave, he gives a great lecture on that. Yeah. yeah he's uh, about these dependence on these, but you know, there are other people do too, such as uh, Peter Gursky, my, my good friend from the head of the Cochrane collaboration. He wrote a book about these chemicals and how dependent you come. Because, actually, he worked with Robert Whitaker. The two of them worked together to try and get some changes done internationally, but the drug companies are just so powerful, so much money. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, George is having inguinal hernia surgery on July 1st. Is there anything you think I should do in relation to the surgery? Yeah, you should be in as best health as possible. You know, you should be in really good health and because it's harder to operate on overweight on healthy people, you can just imagine. You know, you're, you're at a greater surgical risk from the anesthesia, from blood clotting problems. You're more difficult to operate on when you've got all this fat to go through. So, you know, be, just be as healthy as you can be before you avail yourself to the operating room table. And what I would tell you, if you're going to have anything done like that, is find an expert. You know, do some interviews. Find out who does these all the time. If I was going to have, I have an inguinal hernia done, I, I would have it done by the surgeon who does pretty much nothing but inguinal hernias all day long through a laparoscope, you know, because not somebody who does them once a month. So you need to pick a good doctor and then you need to, you need to have as uh, little anesthesia as possible. It, you know, and it may not be possible to avoid a general anesthesia, but in most cases, I'd say a local uh, or a spinal anesthesia is safer. But sometimes you can't do that. You have to do, you have to put you to sleep with gases and you run an extra risk here. Um, so besides picking a good team to operate on you and being as healthy as you can be, go for it because you should expect good results. It's a, it's a good repair. They put in a mesh. In most cases, they put in a mesh which may be troubling to some people because putting uh, plastic in your body is, could be problems. Let's, uh, I, won't, I won't go into it, but you, breast implants are where this discussion came, even though they don't, use, uh, they don't use the same material as breast implants. But there's also, uh, the other thing you should know is there's some graphs, you know, they put these meshes in, some are made of plastic. There are graphs made from decay, cadavers, dead people. And there are graphs made from animals. So each of those may also be a problem for you. If you're looking to have an inguinal hernia done, you may say, look, I'm not gonna hurt any animals by taking animal parts. And I understand that. And you're gonna say, well, I'm not gonna take any human, human made meshes or made from human beings because whatever. All right, I have a question. When <clears throat> when I used to work in the operating room years and years ago, I, we would repair inguinal hernias by just sewing them up. I know. Why don't they do that anymore? Well, because of the failure rate. Oh, yeah. Okay. But I, but I agree, you know, sticking these meshes in creates a whole bunch of new problems. There are people who do, if you look up uh, uh, non-graft inguinal hernia repairs, there, there are people all over the country who have different techniques that don't use these meshes that you may want to work, you may want to decide to, that you want to do. I, you know, I, I can just think for myself, I would hate to have this plastic in my body, uh, this foreign substance and would oh, bother me psychologically. <laughs> anyway, that, that you, you've got a little, a little exploring to do and make sure you got the right surgeon, make sure you're in as good a health as possible. 
And if you aren't comfortable with having these meshes made from human beings, animals, or manufactured, then don't then look for somebody who does a, a hernia repair without the mesh. There, just enter it in Google. You get every find everything, everything. Yep. That, thank you for that. Uh, Kimberly says, what causes Schatzky's ring? Schatzky's rings. I got to remember what that is. I, I Google it. It's I something about the esophagus. It says it's a ring uh, of tissue that forms inside the esophagus. Yeah. Well, it'd be from chronic irritation, inflammation. So it would be scar tissue. That's what I, you know, now that you bring the memory back, uh, it, it, this is just scar. Scars is a, a result of chronic inflammation or injury. <laughs> First you start, and you really need to get this fixed in your mind because there are a whole bunch of people out there that are skipping the step of injury and going on to write, tell you that your problems are caused by inflammation. You know, heart disease caused by inflammation, cancer caused by inflammation, Alzheimer's caused by inflammation. Excuse me, Infl inflammation is the reaction the body has secondary to injury. It's the way the body heals itself. Inflammation is redness, swelling, heat, and pain. That, that's all the body has to, to heal things. Whether you, whether you get an infection, whether you bust your head open on a cement sidewalk, you know, the healing process involves inflammation. So you need to ask first, where's the injury coming from? Like with Alzheimer's, that we, we, we haven't talked about that today. We'll talk about it sometime. It comes from the aluminum that ends up in your brain, which is irritating. It's not no, you, you mean it's not from the lack of nuts and DHA? <laughs> right. I, would, I pretty much decided that's not the case. I'm just kidding. No, I know. I know you're just kidding. But yeah. you know, I, I know it bothers you terribly, uh, uh, AJ, because you're trying to share a really helpful message to people. And then you have, you know, uh, some good people who, who should know better come on the show and hawk their products. And uh, although they have a lot of a lot of good things to say, they, they just can't get over hawking the things, supplements they sell. Even when the science says what they're, they're doing is wrong, as came up in our last discussion, when you objected to somebody telling you to eat fat because the fat you eat the fat you wear. And they told you if you didn't take in enough of their well, I don't know what they mentioned. It was their only, their only, but <laughs> DHA supplements that you were going to get Alzheimer's. Yeah. This that is really, just, that, but that scares people into doing yeah, it. Know. You know, I know, of course, but you know, if you don't follow the McDougal diet, you're going to get a car accident <laughs> and you're going to go bankrupt. <laughs> How's that for a pretty good one? Huh? Oh, thank goodness. I follow it. Then. Oh, good. <laughs> When well, I wait a minute. You, you've also got to buy these little pills we sell in addition to the free information. So unless you follow the McDougal diet and you buy these little green pills that are $4 a piece, you have to take eight a day. You're going to go blind. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's something. Oh, I, you know, I wish I was joking. Uh, I, I wish I was joking because that's what they tell you. you you'll, get all, you'll get Alzheimer's. You'll go demented. And, and you'll even go blind, you know, if, if you don't, if you don't, whatever. This is <laughs> not true. There's a vested interest behind these messages. And what's, what's, what's keeps you healthy is it's free. It's God given. It's, it's part of something people have been doing for a long time, two and a half million years, eating <laughs> food. Yep. It's not yep. enough. It's good stuff. Yep. People are asked, uh, a couple of people have asked about gastroparesis. What causes it? What can be done about it? Well, it, what they're talking about gastroparesis, paresis means, uh, well, I had a hemiparesis when I had my stroke. I couldn't move my arm. So paresis is kind of, kind of, of a paralysis. Uh, gastroparesis would be a paralysis of the intestinal tract. And you see it commonly in people who have diabetes. And so what happens is they have a whole bunch of bowel dysfunction, you know, mostly cramps and constipation. And, you know, the bowel muscle just doesn't move because it's it has paresis, it's <clears throat> semi paralyzed. And the nice thing is, is when you eat a good diet, you provide, I know, same old stuff from McDougall. When you eat a good diet, what happens <laughs> is you put things in the intestinal tract that allow it to function as best. 
You got plenty of fiber, which is the non-digestible part of plant foods. Fiber only comes from plants. You got enough fiber to expand the bowel. So it's got plenty of ability to contract. Okay, the ability of the body to contract is based upon a, a law of physics called the law of Laplace, L-A-P-L-A-C-E. Okay, the law of Laplace says that when you contract at large diameters, you don't create much pressure. It just, things just move really functionally. When you create at uh, small diameters, what happens, that? they're like this, small <laughs> diameters like this, what happens is you create high pressures. And uh, anyway, uh, to get the bowel to function really well, you've got to fill it up and give it a reason to contract. It contracts based upon filling it. So, But they're probably trying to sell something, right? To make well, the bowel I don't know what they're doing. I, they don't have very good treatment for gastroparesis. Okay. Out there. They, they, but, I, but I help quite a few people who have it. And as long as they follow the diet, they don't, they're fine. And I'm sure there are, are cases where the ball is so paralyzed, so damaged that they won't be fine. And then maybe you have to add a few extra things like some non-digestible sugars like lactulose. Yeah. It's, it's mostly the food folks. It's but once in a while, I have to use my medical skills. I do, I am a doctor. I'm a <laughs> board certified internist. I'm licensed in at least four states to practice medicine. You know, and I do have a prescription pad. I know you may not think so, but I do. And I do write prescriptions and I try and practice the best medicine I can for each of my patients, which happens to be dealing with the cause. And then what's left over, we deal with the pills. Great, thank you. Mary, there's a question from Julie. What non-aluminum pans do you recommend? Well, there are so many out there these days that, um, what I, the kind I recommend are any kind that has um, a nonstick surface over the top of the aluminum because aluminum is used to conduct heat. So anything that, that is used to cover uh, the aluminum. So there are different varieties. There are many different company, companies that make them. What you're trying to avoid are the ones made from Teflon because they um, have what? what Do they still they? sell those? Yeah, I think they do, but yeah. most of them now they have, on the box, they say no PF. Yeah, P, I was going to say it's PFA, something like that. Yeah, PFOA or something yeah. like that. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. They're, anyway, they're, um, so there are scan, there's one's called Scan Pan. There's one called um, Swiss Diamond. There's one called um, Zinkle Swirling. And um, they're all good as long as they don't contain the PFOAs. So you just do you have quite a mind there lady <laughs> <laughs> they're off so i don't have one that i recommend specifically because everyone that i talk to seems to have a favorite um heather uses a different kind than i do uh, my uh, my son's and his family use a different kind than i do so uh, and they all like theirs but uh you know i, I like them all well, we, I, have a lot, I, we have a lot of I different ones different hanging kinds. up there. I, so. I have no favorites. Of course, I don't do any cooking either. Oh, you do too. I make oatmeal for breakfast. Nice. Yeah, but really, I mean, you know, we've been together for 50 years. And I'll tell you, it's every day she surprises me. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's just so amazing. Well, I, I think, you know, I, I kind of tease her that, you know, someday, and it's going to happen, we're going to get old. <laughs> and she's going to have to take care of me. <laughs> and she will be able to, thank goodness. And anyway, I was, don't look forward to that, Mary. But you know, That's all right. we'll, I'll we'll, be here for you. We, we've been together so long. I'm sure we'll, <laughs> we'll go out gracefully together. Yeah. Go out with a bang, flying a plane. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. 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 That, did you say, say flying a plane? Yeah. Hey, AJ. <laughs> he talked about that. Don't, don't tempt him. <laughs> you know, we, we, used to, we used to own a, a Baron, which is a twin, twin engine Beechcraft airplane. And one of the jokes was you only spin a Baron once. You don't understand, I know, but you only spin a Baron once. They don't come out of a spin. Some airplanes, you can spin them, and we've done that. Uh, but they're spin-rated airplanes. And, and you, you spin. You just you put it in a stall. 
probably heard of a stall. Put it in a stall, and then because you're not going forward, you'd have no lift under your wings, and you just start spinning towards the ground. And the airplane, we had airplanes. So I, th I think the Dakota we had would, would come out of a spin, but the Baron did not come out of a spin. We never tested it. <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> that was a joke. That was a joke. You could never um, spin the Baron. And yeah, you got, you're tired of life? Let's go spin the Baron. <laughs> well, gosh, you learned something I did not know. <laughs> yeah, well, you know. <laughs> I'm we, not always try to, we always try to teach you something new every yeah. time, AJ. Well, thank you. That's what I love. I look forward to this so much. Okay. Uh, this is from June. No oil vegan, prior lifelong vegetarian for decades, but I have high cholesterol. The doctor says it's due to carbs. Well, the doctor doesn't know what the heck he's talking about. What can I say? You know, I, I gave a, a talk this past week to a uh, medical school in Texas, uh, to their occupational medical doctors. And, you know, I, I pointed out to them a couple of things. One is I pointed out to them that in 2011, I got uh, SB 380 passed in the state of California, which forces the 11 medical schools in California uh, to teach their students human nutrition. And uh, I'll include it with that, that law, which was signed into law by Jerry Brown in September of 2011, is the fact that the 500 hospitals in California need to teach in some of their conferences, human nutrition. On my birthday, May 17th, 2022, on my birthday, one of our senators, James McGovern, proposed a law which is passed by Congress. Already it's been passed by Congress, it passed May 17th, which will force physicians to learn what human beings eat. But it's only been passed by one house. The senators will probably dump that one too. <laughs> anyway, your doctor knows nothing about what human beings eat. So don't take any advice from your physician unless he or she has a particular interest in food and then ask them about what supplements they sell first. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> uh, you had earlier talked about in the Adventist bookstores, how they have the canned meat, the Worthington uh -huh. meat. And Susan said, what is really wrong with them? She doesn't eat them, but she wants to be able to explain to other people. Well, they're 50% fat and they're made of- it's High protein too. Yeah, they're made of isolated wheat protein, most of them. They, they take uh, setan. And uh, the way you make setan is you take wheat, you grind it up to a flour and then you wash it with water. You've done that, haven't you, Mary? Mm -hmm. You, it, we, just because I wanted to try it. Yeah, you wash it. You wash everything away from it except for the protein, which is wheat and protein. You're left with this little glob out of a five-pound bag of flour. You're left with this little glob that's about as big as you can fit in the center of my hands, and it looks like library paste. Well, it's just this white. So they take clear, this clearish white paste. protein and they mix it up with grease, probably vegetable oil for sure because they're vegetarians. Yeah. And then they make, make it into something that resembles, I don't know what, I've never seen Sausages meat. Sausages and- uh, Yeah, but the, the cans, she's talking about the cans. I can't, you know, what Well, is they put little sausages in the cans. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Oh, I mean, we never ate them either, but I've, I've seen them in the stores that we- All I remember into. is I got kicked out of Adventist <laughs> camp at least twice <laughs> because I said bad things. So I'm not gonna say any more bad things about those- About their canned About foods. the Morning Star okay. products or the- Loma Linda well, well, Worthington as well. Worthington, Worthington and Loma Linda. I, yeah. you, I used to get into such trouble. Why? <laughs> because they made a ton of money off selling this garbage to the Adventist. And I said it was bad. I never said it was bad until somebody asked me. I knew better. And I did everything I could to avoid the topic. And lo and behold, you know, 500 people in a crowd, you find at least one person asked that question. What do I think about these, these fake foods made by the Adventist food companies? And the answer was, oh, I guess I won't be invited back again. Yeah. Well, so you probably feel the same about the Beyond Meat, the Impossible Burger, because that's basically yeah. simple ingredients, right? The fat. Well, I, I do. They have different problems with them. Uh, you know, again, I'd have to become an expert to tell you all the problems. But I'll tell you one problem that really troubles me is that when you make fake meats, what you're saying to the public is that meat is a normal part of the diet. So we have to have a fake they're saying to people, that's part of what human beings eat. 
and because it's unhealthy for you and the environment, I'll make something that looks just like it, tastes just like it. So in other words, uh, they've redeemed meat as being good for you by making fake well, meats. I, no, and the other problem is, is that people don't think that they can eat a diet without meat in it. Oh, boy. So they make these meat products so that people think, oh, well, I could probably do it then. If you give me something that tastes like meat. Are you listening, Bill Gates? <laughs> Are you listening, Bill Gates? <laughs> Uh, you go around the you go around the planet and you tell people that we should look at any every possibility to save our planet from global warming. And he does it from one of his two favorite hamburger joints in Seattle, Washington. That's where he does the interviews from, and he's in the business of making fake meats. Doesn't that tell you a lot about where this guy is in terms of his understanding? Boy, if we could get his mind, if we could get him enrolled. I, I believe he's sincere. I really do. I believe he really would like to be able to solve the planet problems. I, I know I'm absolutely certain he can. He just can't see over his own dinner plate because he never mentions food as, a, as the, the key ingredient to saving our home. No, he doesn't know. He just doesn't know. He doesn't want to know. <laughs> That's probably true. You know, he, could, he couldn't possibly have existed in this environment of understanding of what's going on and fail to hear about the agriculture businesses and what they do to provide damage to the planet. You know, the cows and the sheep and the pigs, the chickens, and destroying all our fish. Come on, Bill, wake up. Yep. Does Thank Bill you. listen to your show? I doubt it. <laughs> I doubt. Well, how about, Al, Al, how about Al Gore? Does he listen to your show? I really doubt uh, it. You know, Al Gore, Al Gore he, you know, when I first did the article on, on him and his Inconvenient Truth lecture presentation, which is phenomenal, changed my whole life, that presentation did. Uh, at that time, he was in the Black Angus cow business. I mean, that was part of his family. I think business. he still is. Maybe, yeah. Uh, I don't follow him around, so I... I want to be careful about that. And then back then, back then he used to look like he ate the same thing he raised. Wasn't very healthy looking and pretty overweight. And he got trimmed for a while. I heard he went vegan and then I don't know what he's doing now, but there's another powerful person. There are a lot of powerful people, but they're afraid. You know, they're afraid about their next election. They're afraid about, about uh, whether they might not have as big a bank account as they once had. You ought to be afraid for your kids and your grandkids. That's what you ought to be afraid for. Good grief. So someone's been diagnosed with Barrett's esophagus, even though no cancer was found, should they keep getting endoscopies? Doctor says need to. Yeah, well, the doctor ought to look at the data, which <laughs> says that he cannot find esophageal cancer early enough to save the patient's life. So if you, you know, if you want to hear bad news, keep having the esophageal, uh, the esophagus looked at. You, with your next visit with your doctor, you ought to say, okay, you give me the data that shows that you looking in my esophagus and finding the esophageal cancer at an earlier stage will prolong my life. Show me one, one paper, one, one research. And I, I don't even care if it's a double blind or controlled trial. Just show me one paper that even suggests it. And your doctor doesn't have it because that's why you're having it done. You're having it done so that you can live longer. And you believe that by looking periodically, they're gonna catch it early enough. So at a point where it hasn't spread throughout the rest of the body, they're gonna save your life. That's nonsense. And your doctor knows it. He doesn't give him my, give him my email address. I'll make sure he does. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Oh, we have a question. I forgot to even look at the ones that were previously submitted because there were so many in the chat. But Terry says, can you please ask Dr. McDougall and Mary how they feel about mushrooms in the diet? We were comparing the whole food plant-based diet with the Gerson method, which doesn't allow mushrooms because huh. they're a fungus. We're at a totally healthy, good weight, but we're wondering if mushrooms should be included. Well, that's, you know, that, that's a, a deep question. Uh, and we're, this day and age, mushrooms mean something different than they used to. So we'll just talk about the regular old mushrooms. I, I don't know anything unhealthy about eating mushrooms. And uh, so I, I would think it'd be yeah, fine to include it. We, we like use them all the time in, in yeah. our food and they, they taste great. They add a lot of flavor to food. So um, I, I, and I don't see them being magical as far as healing you either. 
plants. So anyway, those, those are the mushrooms you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, most, most people in the plant-based space say they're very beneficial for so many reasons, anti-cancer yeah. and. Right. I, I think they're stretching it a little bit. You know, the, I think most of this is theory, but I, I think it's enough to say that they're not in any way harmful. They're plant food. You know, they don't scream when you harvest them. <laughs> I never liked them though. I mean, I'll eat them because they're, but I, I don't really like them. They're just, yeah, yeah, they're, I understand. They're there's just something kind of weird to me. I, I like them in the air fryer when they're dry, but there's just something, I don't know. I just right. don't like mushrooms. I'll eat them, but I don't. Well, they get really slimy if they get too wet. Yeah, there's just something. So, so you're not, you're supposed to eat them really fresh and you're not supposed to get them wet. You, you clean them with a brush right. and not water. Right. They're just not my thing, but I'll eat them. I'm not, <laughs> not that picky. Yeah, well, anyway. But AJ, I think the message that you should get is if you don't like them, don't eat them. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, 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 what I mean is like, if I'm going to somebody's house, not that yeah. I've been invited anywhere, I wouldn't, I wouldn't not eat it because of that. But on my own, uh, I really don't seek them out. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. No. yeah. Okay. So this was sent in by, what's your name? Barbie. Uh, she's been following your plan for over four months. She's just saw her doctor regarding her three-month blood test. A1C was lower. Cholesterol was in normal range, lost 12 pounds. However, her triglycerides were significantly higher before she began the vegan diet. No, been no oil, but she's added rice and potatoes and wondering if that's why her triglycerides could have gone up. Well, when she says significantly higher, my guess is they're still within the range. Uh, triglycerides uh, do go up when you change to a starch-based diet. But that's because uh, eating all those animal foods and lack of carbohydrate uh, artificially suppresses the blood cholesterol uh, or triglycerides. Triglycerides are fat, all right? And uh, they're, they're fat in the blood is what they are. I think the best way to imagine it is if you put a pot of chicken soup in the refrigerator, you get a layer of fat forming on top. And that's what triglycerides are. If I take your blood and I suck it into a tube, you know, through a needle, and I set the tube on a counter, it was in a matter of an hour, you'll have a layer of fat on the top. That's the triglycerides. There are some people who have so much fat in their blood that before you take the needle out of their arm, the fat's already separated from the red blood cells and you can see this big glob of fat in the tube. So uh, if the triglycerides went up, my guess is they went up from 80 to 140 or something like that, or 120 to 180. A normal triglyceride is less than 200, but that, that's still darn low. I don't really start even thinking about whether I should give any special advice to somebody if their triglycerides are say below three to 500. And when you get up to a thousand, which I've seen quite a few times, you know, I'd be concerned because there's so much fat in the blood that the blood sludges and you can increase the risk of, uh, of organ damage such as pancreatitis. And my record in triglycerides is a, a fellow I saw with triglyceride of, of 5,558. Wow. Which by the way, in 12 days, we got down to 900. So uh, alcohol raises triglycerides, sugar raises triglycerides, uh, even fruit, I think, raises triglycerides. So if you're concerned about the number, I would make sure all the alcohol and all the simple sugars were out of the diet. And no smoothies. Right, no smoothies, yeah. But, but if you're not concerned about them, you shouldn't be unless they're up in the you know, four, five, six, 800 range then I would, uh, I, would, I would not worry about them because in time they come down. When you stop losing weight, one of the reasons that triglycerides go up is because you mobilize fat from your body fat into the blood. Remember, triglycerides are just fat in the blood. So when you lose the weight, they move from the body fat to the bloodstream. So that's one reason you will do it. You know, just starving will move them into the bloodstream too because you mobilize fat. Anyway, uh, there's no good treatment for high triglycerides. We used to use niacin, but when the studies came out that showed using niacin increased the risk of stroke, most doctors stopped using it. Uh, we used to use clofibrates, which are still prescribed. You know, big money made in for clofibrates, but they increase the risk of cancer and they don't prevent heart disease. So the only reason I can think of prescribing is to make the drug company some extra money. And uh, so otherwise just time 
when you get down to trim body weight, a little exercise helps lower triglycerides. But I think you're worried, you're not patting yourself on the back enough for the good things. And you're worried about something that's irrelevant. Right. Somebody's asking what you think about oil pulling. I don't know about oil pulling. Do you know about oil no. pulling? I, I, I've heard it's, I've it's heard a came from one of our shows, maybe with you, AJ. You tell us what it is and we'll comment on it. I think they swish coconut oil in their mouth. I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, and it's supposed to pull the oil out of your ear, you know. That's why you lose weight, right? As long as you don't swallow the coconut yeah. oil. I don't think so. You know, the coconut, the coconut oil has been something promoted again for financial interest, coconut oil and coconut meat and et cetera. It's been promoted for at least 20 years. If you go and look at my website, you'll see an article I did on coconuts back in 2006. So it's been a topic that's been around for a long time. You know, coconut oil is so special, it cures infections, all kinds of things. They just, the claims are, are boundless. You know, coconut oil is the oil made by the coconut, which happens to be a plant. It happens to be a highly saturated oil, which has been the reason why for years it's been associated with more heart disease. I don't know if that's true because it's a plant. But I do know that because that oil is oil, you're gonna get fat eating it. The fat you eat, the fat you wear. And I do believe that our creator put the, the coconut oil in the hardest shell unknown to man. And what's the hardest shell you ever run into? You ever try and open a coconut? It's really hard. Yeah, you gotta get your <laughs> hammer out there and maybe more. And you don't open it with just a little nutcracker. Or, you know, you, you, you could bang all day on that coconut. It's not going to let you have the oil. What do you think? Do you think there's a reason that that shell is so... Well, and, and well, and it's got this shell all around it, too. First, you have to pull all that off. I mean, the, the fuzz. All the, all the fuzz stuff. <laughs> and then you then you get to the coconut, and you have to bang. Maybe you, maybe you can bang two of them together. Remember? I don't think... I, don't think, I think you got to get a big hand. Well, there's, there's three little spots. Yeah, there's three little eyes on the top. Yeah, when we lived in Hawaii. Hawaii. They told, showed us how to do it. Yeah. But you needed a hammer. It wasn't I like mean, that. how did our ancestors open them? I, I have uh, no and I idea. bet they took a rock and did it with oh, a big probably. rock. They're pretty, pretty, pretty ingenious. Our ancestors, they, they, they knew how to use <laughs> rocks yeah. and a lot of other things. You know, it's amazing how the truth is the truth is the truth. And you look back at, uh, at history and it tells you that eating rich food makes you fat and sick. You know, I can go back 5,000 years to the, to the pharaohs and the priests, kings and queens of Egypt and look at their tombs and see stories about how they ate. And I can look at their dead bodies preserved as mummies through autopsy or CAT scans. And I see that they're diseased just like Americans. You know, in studies of the Egyptian mummies, uh, they, in one particular paper that was published, they identified, they identified 44 of the mummies had arterial structures. In other words, they could find parts of the coronary artery or parts of the leg artery, 44 of them they found. Out of those 20 had severe atherosclerosis. They, they found gallbladder disease in the mummies. They also found uh, this, this queen who was obese. They had to have a special, whatever they put them in. Sarcophagus. Thank you, sarcophagus. You know, they, they had, let's see, what else did they have? Um, Oh, they had, uh, they had uh, spina bifida. Spina bifida is due to a lack of, uh, uh, a lack of um, folic acid in the diet, the native diet. And folic acid comes from foliage. So you know how women are promoted to take folic acid supplements to prevent neurotube defects like um, anencephaly where the, and I, I've seen this. I, I've actually been in uh, two deliveries where the baby was born with no skull. Uh, pretty traumatic. And I've been in on uh, many, many, many deliveries where the child was born with the end of the spinal cord exposed. They've been paralyzed. That's from spina bifida. It's a serious problem. It's due to lack of folic acid in the diet. They're promoting folic acid pills at a dose, by the way, that increases the risk of the general population getting more heart disease. But it probably prevents these neurotube defects but why not go to the original source of folic acid? The foliage, it's from plants. So anyways, these, this at least one mummy lady who had a baby had a folic acid deficient diet because her baby was born with a, with a spina bifida. 
It's due to, due to lack of folic acid in the diet when you're pregnant or before you're pregnant. You actually have to start it before you're yeah. pregnant. So anyway, um, so these, these dumb past relatives of ours weren't so stupid. <laughs> they knew a lot of stuff, AJ, that we've forgotten. And, uh, you know, they knew that, that you know, ought to eat corn. I mean, the Aztecs and the Mayans, they were people of the corn. And the Incas, they were potato eaters and couscous. And the people from Asia were rice eaters until they started watching cable news and <laughs> finding out if they made a ton of money, they get to buy a Tesla and fly first class on the airplanes. And then they decided, well, we're just going to eat like Americans. And they look like Americans. And boy, don't they ever. I bet you can think of a few political leaders who are pretty pudgy. I'm not going to mention any names. I bet you could. <laughs> Good. Yeah, I, don't want, I don't get any trouble. Nope, you know, it's just, it's right there in front of your eyes. Just open your eyes and look. You know, if everybody else in a population in Asia is trim and they live on rice, which by the way, I'm thinking of this country, everybody's trim except for the leader. What do you think happened? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea, AJ. I just don't like to be. I mean, I mean, pictures of you know, you see the the people in the streets and the marching and the parades, and nobody's overweight except for the leader. Yep. Uh, Jackie says, "I'm concerned. I've been whole food plant based five years. I'm okay. 61. Have excellent cholesterol. BMI 21. Numbers are excellent. I only have high blood pressure when I go to the doctor's office or have high stress at work. My blood pressure is normal on the weekends. I told my doctor about the chlorothylidone that Dr. McDougall prescribes, and she says it's great for someone with edema or excessive swelling, but it could not work in my case. She prescribed by." which is a beta blocker and said it also helps with anxiety. She said she has patients that only take it for work-related stress. I've never been on medication, but I don't want to risk high blood pressure because of work-related stress. Can you address this, please? Well, first of all, work-related stress is not the problem. Okay, uh, that kind of anxiety or pain does not damage the arteries. It's the damaged arteries that raise the blood pressure. And there's a whole lecture that I gave actually in one of your presentations about high blood pressure, you ought to listen to that for lecture. Uh, beta blockers uh, used to be a first line or at least a second line a drug that was chosen for treating high blood pressure, not anymore, because it's not a very good blood pressure drug. Uh, relieve anxiety, well, it, yeah, it does. Beta blockers are used by many professional speakers because they get, away, get rid of stage fright. Yeah, that's true. But is that what you wanna treat a stage fright? Or do you want to treat your blood pressure? Uh, chlorothaladone is the only drug that's uh, really been shown to reduce the risk of stroke and heart attack. And this was done in the 1970s at the veterans study, which was only involved a few people. I think it was like 75 people. And you, these are people with, with morbid hypertension. They were dying. And they made a big difference by putting them on chlorothaladone. Every other blood pressure medication uh, all, all they had to do was to show that they lowered blood pressure. You didn't have to show you prevented stroke or heart attack or death. Just to lower blood pressure. And they assumed it was the same as chlorothaladone. Well, it's not the same. Anyway, most people can get their blood pressure normal. Uh, what, what, what our research says of uh, 1,703 people. When well, we took a look at people who had blood pressures of uh, 140 over 90 or greater, most of them were on medication. We found the average drop in blood pressure was 18 over 11 millimeters of mercury in seven days. And that nearly 90% of people were able to reduce or stop their blood pressure medications. That, 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 you know, just by changing their diet. Now you shouldn't give up until you've lost all the excess body fat because, uh, well, I don't know, being fat raises the blood pressure, but let's just say it might. So uh, it, it's not the way I would treat you. Uh, I think your doctor is, uh, you know, I think your doctor's probably being a little defensive. In other words, who's that Dr. McDougall guy telling me how to practice medicine? So I think your doctor could become a little more up to date on who should be treated and what drugs should be used. And I don't mean becoming up to date by the drug detail lady who comes in the office in a short skirt, beautiful dress. 
with pizza for the uh, pizza and donuts for the front office staff. Oh, they, I remember those, uh, AJ. I used to have these gorgeous young cheerleaders come into my office and make my day, but they don't do that anymore. I tell Mary, it's a good thing she's so good looking. Yeah, uh, I don't complain. Anyway, well, getting, I'm getting a little, little getting in what you call misogyny, right? Misogynistic. <laughs> yeah, misogynistic. You had to teach me that word. Oh, that's funny. Hey, you you know a lot about uh, MS because you've done some research on it. And Marianne says, are the annual MRIs necessary if you have it? No. What are you, what are you looking for? Ask the doctor what they're looking for. If they're looking for an indication to prescribe another ineffective, criminally expensive drug, then you should go looking for it, but you're not. I mean, first of all, I believe, and Dr. Swank work, I think, demonstrate pretty, pretty positively that you can stop this disease with a low fat diet. Uh, if you look at the results of using drug therapy, they're miserable. You know, it's not, not, not what you're looking for in terms of a cure. So why is the doctor checking every, every year? You know, if, if there was any drug that worked well, let's, let's do it now, doc. Let's not wait until I end up losing a whole bunch more of my brain. Let's do it now. Well, there aren't, you know, the drugs are, are criminally expensive, like $70,000 a year just for the drug and uh, highly ineffective as far as, uh, as, far as uh, delaying the progression of the disease, which is what you're concerned about. Keeping you alive and delaying the progression of the disease. They're woefully inadequate. And uh, anyway, challenge your doctor with those thoughts. You can tell them who said so. <laughs> right. You're going to love this question. You've answered it before, but well, don't we need fat to absorb the nutrients in our greens? Yeah. Well, it's actually, I think it was more, don't you need fatty salad dressings to, to absorb the vitamins? that we get in our salad in leaves, yeah, in the vegetables, <laughs> isn't that, I think that's where the discussion comes from. And again, this is about 25 years ago. And you can go to my website, look under hot topics, look under the section on nutrition, look under vegetable oils and the research paper that originally suggested this, you will find as well as my answer to this. And essentially it comes down to, yeah, there's a little bit of truth in it, but you get plenty of absorption of these uh, vitamins and other essential nutrients without adding the oil. And why there's should oil you... in our food? Yeah, well, there's enough oil in the food. To us. Fat soluble vitamins are absorbed. Yeah, it, it, you know, rice is five percent fat. So, anyways, uh, it does, does. It's it's not a not an approach you want to take. It's an old idea, which has been put in proper perspective. I did it. I think. I think. I think it's, this idea should have died a long time ago. Yes, you have vitamins that are like to be absorbed when they're in a fatty environment. Okay, fine. But as Mary says, there's plenty of fat in the food. You don't need any extra fat. Right. Here's a question I don't think I've heard before on hyperhidrosis. Can you, a uh, question from Lauren. Can you ask Dr. McDougall, will the starch solution diet take care of it? And does he suggest not to take a multivitamin? Is it hyperhidrosis? Hydrogenide is superfluous? I don't know. What is hyperstone? I don't know what that is. Hyperhidrosis. Hyperhidrosis. Well, that means excess sweating. Is that right? Excess sweat? I think that means excess sweating. I'll look it up. I'm I'm not the doctor. (laughs) Yeah, really. What what did I go to medical school for? Hyperhidrosis. I can't remember all this stuff. Yeah, excessive sweating. No, you got it right. Hi, hi, you got it exactly right. Well, there you, know you go. Medical there you, school yeah, is good really. for you. I get to keep my life. Normally, excessive sweating involving the extremities, underarms, and yeah. face, usually unrelated to body temperature or exercise. Right, right. Well, this would be a case where somebody would want to use uh, aluminum uh, antiperspirants, probably as a roll-on rather than spraying them in their face. I don't know anything else that will stop the hyperhidrosis. Other than surgery to remove the sweat glands, they do that sometimes. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so in that case, you actually would say it would be okay to use a roll-on antiperspirant? Yeah, I, I think so, especially if the problem was outweighed the risk. The, the risk are is aluminum causes Alzheimer's. 
And one of the more serious portals of entry is through the nose. And what people do every day is they spray their nose with antiperspirants. I know they're trying to hit the pit, but they miss the pit and they hit the nose. But, the, but a lot of them come in roll-on form. Yeah, well, these would be less of a problem, even though- But aluminum, wouldn't you absorb some of the aluminum Some from of them? it, but not like when you're spraying, you're spraying your okay. nose. It's much worse. I don't even know that they make, do they make still make sprays? Oh, yeah, it's in the new lecture that I'm putting out okay. on, on aging. I haven't seen one because I've never well, looked for aluminum, aluminum chlorohydrate, this one has. Yeah, but look them up, look up antiperspirants. You'll see that all of them have an aluminum Well, something. I know they do, but I didn't know they still made sprays. They still make sprays. Oh. Okay. Yeah, and, and you know, you look at people who have Alzheimer's, those who have the worst cases, the most progressive cases, the most severe cases of Alzheimer's, have the a large number of what we call senile plaques in the stalk of the brain called the olfactory lobe. And that's why we know the more serious portal of entry is through the nose, not the mouth for aluminum. But the mouth is important too. The skin's probably important too, but the nose is a big deal. Don't spray it in your nose. <laughs> yep. Uh, Darlene wants to know if your diet can help Parkinson's. Well, only in the sense that uh, the kind of diet I recommend is low on the food chain. So that means you're gonna have less fat soluble chemicals in your basic diet. Uh, organophosphates, pesticides is what we're talking about here, are fat soluble chemicals. And that's how you get Parkinson's. You have a genetic tendency, which uh, is that you can't, you can't take the organophosphates and deactivate them in your system as readily as, as most people can. Because most people who breathe in pesticides, organophosphates, I mean, they're damaged. These are toxic, toxic substances, but they don't die, end up with Parkinson's. Parkinson's disease occurs in people who are, who genetically can't break down the organophosphates. Actually, the alleles, the, the genetic markers have been identified uh, as far as parts of the, of the genome that uh, produce enzymes that break down organophosphates. They're, this is all worked out. You can look up on the internet. <laughs> So you can look up organophosphates, uh, pesticides, and Parkinson's. You read all day. Uh, why aren't you told much about it? Well, because show me the money. <laughs> there's no money. Uh, yeah. right? There's no treatment for Parkinson's either. Well, there's there are treatments, and they just kind of uh, help with the symptoms. Like there's levodopa or Cinnamon, which has been a you know a revolution in the care of somebody with Parkinson's. Parkinson's patients, they have all these, uh, these motions that are hard to control or it's stiffness. Gosh. Well, they're, they're uh, non-intentional uh, non tremors. In other words, they sit there and they just move like this. And uh, pretty good. Yeah. Pretty good. Yeah. Well, that's because I've seen a lot of people <laughs> with Parkinson's. Uh. <laughs> anyway, uh, they're taking levodopa, which is a, you know, substance is, well, anyways, it's a, it's a chemical that, the brain requires and it will quiet these Parkinson's movies down tremendously. And we, we, we give the levodopa in the form of something called sentiment, which is uh, a compound that causes more levodopa to get in the nervous system because the nervous system breaks down the levodopa and it activates it. And so they sell it as sentiment and it's a really good drug. But you, you, first of all, you wanna not get the Parkinson's because once you once you have destroyed the substantia nigra of the brain, which is like right here, it's gone. It don't grow back. So you need to eat a diet, live in an environment with very little pollutants. And the diet that gives you the least environmental contamination is our diet, because you eat low on the food chain. You increase the concentration of these these fat soluble poisons a thousand fold as you move up the food chain. It goes from the seaweed and the plants and the grains and the grasses to the fish and the cow and what else grazes, whatever, cow <laughs> grazes. And, and then when we eat the cow, you know, we increase, we take in a whole bunch of that stuff, which represents tons of grain that the cow ate. You, you biomagnify the concentration. It becomes biomagnified. And then you get to the top of the food chain and who's at the very top of the food chain? We well, are. 
no, no, it's, it's, it's baby <laughs> suckling on mother's breast. You know, the, we have, of course, this baby formula thing going around. And you know what I think every time they talk about having a problem with baby, getting the baby formula, is I think there should have been a lot more encouragement to breastfeed is what I think. Even though there are some women as much as uh, they, they try, they can't breastfeed and they have to go on these, uh, these infant formulas. And by the way, if you haven't noticed, the infant formulas that are in short supply are the ones that- uh, They're hypoallergenic. Have, yeah, they're hypoallergenic. They're the ones that are specially processed. They, uh, they put them through a, a process that, that breaks up the cow protein so it's less allergic. And those are the ones that, uh, that are not on the marketplace, not the regular formulas. So these parents with, you know, a lot of the parents that have kids that they think are need these formulas and they don't. And this would never have been a problem if they'd have breastfed. And New Zealand is one country that does not allow these formulas to be sold over the, over the counter. They think they're dangerous enough. And I don't want to go into the details of that because I haven't really looked into it lately. But anyway, uh, this is a problem. And what you need to do is correct the problem by doing something naturally, which is encouraging more breastfeeding. And then you, you know, anyway, I, it's, it's more than that's probably enough. That's enough. <laughs> Did you answer the second part of the hyperhidrosis question about not recommending a multivitamin? I, I, I can't imagine why a multivitamin would help. This is a problem of, of excess production of sweat by the sweat glands. The only way I know they can stop it is aluminum-based uh, antiperspirants. Right. I've, think never, I've never heard of a vitamin causing think, it or correcting it. I think they were just asking that as a second question, just in general. Do you recommend people take a multivitamin? I, I strongly recommend you don't take vitamins, except for B12, which is a whole separate conversation. When you take vitamins, you're taking isolated concentrated nutrients, which cause imbalances in your cells which cause you to have an increased risk of cancer and heart disease and death. The estimates are based on large studies. If you take uh, things like beta carotene, folic acid, uh, vitamin E, a whole bunch of supplements. I, I, I can't think of one that doesn't have this type of reputation with it. Uh, you increase the risk of cancer and heart disease by about 20 to 30% and you increase the risk of dying overall. And taking a multivitamin, I'll never forget this particular research paper. The Cochrane Collaboration estimated, these are people you know I have a lot of respect for. They estimate for every 1 million multivitamin consumers. That's the kind, you know, one a day my mother used to give me with my orange juice in the morning, which made me sick to my stomach. I thought it was the orange juice. It was really the greasy vitamin pill. Anyway, uh, if you take that, what, 1 million people, 1 million users, you have 9,000 extra deaths. You create nutritional imbalances. You see, all this has been worked out for hundreds of thousands of 400, 400 million years. You know, the food with the organism, it's all been worked out. And when you start messing with the food, you start messing with a system that's been perfectly designed and you start giving isolated concentrated nutrients, you set the whole balance off and you increase the risk of disease. You, you take vitamin D, for example, uh, taking vitamin D shots or pills, you know, all, all studies I'm aware of, of taking doses of 2000 international units or more, it increases your risk of falls and fractures because taking that unnatural form of D, remember D is made by the, by the skin from sunlight. By taking this uh, concentrated isolated nutrient, vitamin D in the form of pills and shots, is you cause imbalances in your nervous system and in your muscle fibers that cause you to fall and get fractures. Don't take this stuff. <laughs> oh man. Well, speaking of falls and fracture, there was a question about Fosamax. Do you recommend it for osteoporosis? There's phosphonates, there's the general category. And phosphonax is one of the more popular ones. The answer is no. And why don't I? Because there's a whole list of side effects, including more fractures, taking the phosphonax. And there's a whole discussion, I'm actually gonna give it in the women's talk that we'll be putting out a talk for postmenopausal women. 
and it is just a discussion about relative versus absolute benefits. And the absolute benefits from taking bisphosphonates like Fosamax are extremely small. The risks are real, but the benefits are extremely small. They're advertised as uh, uh, based upon relative benefits, okay? So like when, 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 I, when I, here, let me explain to you this way. I, I used to gamble before I figured out that the casinos just were gonna take my money period, I might as well give it to them. And I used to go to the craps table, which was my favorite game, number one, but it's still my favorite <laughs> game. And I used to take and put these $5 chips on. Okay, the guy next to me was putting chips that were five zero zero on them, $500 a chip. You know, when we were done, we all lost 100% of our chips, but that was the relative value, the absolute value, since he started with chips that were a hundred times more valuable than mine. From an absolute point of view, he lost 500 times more money than I lost. So see what they do is they, they tell you the benefit and what they do is they, they show you the relative benefit. In other words, you used to have one fracture and well, let's say you had, two, you had two fractures in a thousand people, okay? and you cut the down to one fracture in a thousand people, you just reduce the risk of fractures by 50%. But you actually only stop one fracture in a thousand people. Anyway, it's too long a discussion. <laughs> you, yeah. You've already discussed this on yeah, her yeah. program before. Have yeah. I talked about this? Yeah, yes. absolutely. But we can, I'll see if I can find a, a link to that. Um, Jimmy says, why do our triglycerides go up when we have fruit or sugar? Because the body will take a small amount of sugar, which is in fruit or, or in uh, you know table sugar, and it will convert it into fat. Only a tiny amount. In fact, uh, it's called de novo lipogenesis, and I talked to you about this in, in my lecture on, on weight to try and show you that sugar has very little impact on, uh, on making your body fat. You have to take in 50% more table sugar 135 grams of table sugar every day for four months to gain one pound of body fat. The body is so inefficient at converting sugar to fat. It's efficient enough so it causes a slight rise, but not enough so that it causes accumulation of body fat. So that's why you start on a low sugar diet. A lot of people come in on high carb or excuse me, low carb, high protein, high fat diets like the Atkins diet, or they come into the program starting out by starving themselves. So they're carbohydrate deficient. And then all of a sudden they're exposed to carbohydrate. Well, the body, you know, I look at it as the body just does what it's supposed to do, which makes a little bit of fat, which are called triglycerides. You know, in other words, you come from an abnormal condition of uh, being deficient in sugar because you're starving, you're dieting, or you're eating one of these low carb diets. And then you start eating carbs, the body does make a little bit of fat from the sugar, but not much. Not enough so that it's a cause of being obese. But the fat you eat the fat you wear. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Because well, you don't have to do anything except move the fat from your fork and spoon to your butt. Okay, when it comes when it comes to converting sugar into fat, you have to rearrange the chemical structure from a ring structure. You remember that a ring structure, like this. Okay, <laughs> carbons are in a ring to a to a to a chain, straight chain, carbon after carbon. You have to break this ring. It costs thirty percent of the calories to break the ring and turn it into a chain. It's very expensive costs 30, the body's not going to waste, doesn't, doesn't do inefficient things. That's more, <laughs> more biochemistry than they can tolerate. Well, speaking of biochemistry, Sheila says, when you're losing weight, does it contribute to higher cholesterol? I've lost 30 pounds this year and my doctor wants me to take Crestor. I would like to avoid the drug. Well, first of all, healthy people should not be taking statins, period. That's what everybody in the medical business knows if they read the research. In other words, if you haven't had a heart attack, heart surgery, stroke, then you shouldn't be taking statins regardless of how high your cholesterol is. And I do say that with some reservation. There are people who run cholesterols in the 500 or 900 range and 
I'd probably put them on statins. I don't know whether I, I, I'm doing it for the right reasons or not, but I would probably be frightened enough of that kind of cholesterol that I would put them on statins. But for the average cholesterol of say 200, 300, you know, if you've not had a heart attack or some type of event that predicts you're gonna have another event, very likely, then you shouldn't be on statins. What we're talking about is primary prevention. In other words, nothing's happened to you. We're trying to prevent the first event, primary prevention, condemned. All right. I don't know anybody who talks differently. If you uh, if you've had a an event like a heart attack or heart surgery, in other words, you're at high risk of having another event. Then it's recommended you go on statins. And but there's a lot of question of whether that's worthwhile either. The, the problem of rotten arteries is not statin deficiency. It's so much about the wrong food that causes the tissues in the inside of the arteries or the artery tissues to be diseased. You can't isolate it down to one component of the food, cholesterol, and, and expect by somehow or another stopping the production of cholesterol by the body because you know animals make cholesterol. We got a body, we're an animal. You, know, you can't take one element and expect it to fix a problem. It just doesn't do it. And that's what the statin industry knows well. Um, Anyway, so first of all, I, I would not put a patient of mine on statins unless they were, uh, they were dealing with secondary prevention. In other words, they've already declared themselves as sick. As far as losing weight goes, yeah, cholesterol comes out of your body fat and you could see a rise in cholesterol in your blood, but we don't generally, the average drop in cholesterol is 22 milligrams per deciliter in seven days. So, you know, and the bulk of the population is rare, but it could happen. And uh, once you stop losing weight, that will stop. Yeah, but I don't, see, I don't, tr I don't treat numbers very often. I, I treat people a lot. So if you want me to treat a number, like your blood sugar, your blood pressure, your cholesterol, you're, you're asking me to do an, an adequate job on you. You're asking me to make your numbers look good. Not, not, not your body look good. You want me to make the, I can make the, I can make the numbers anything I want. I'm a doctor. I got a prescription pad. I can make your cholesterol 30 milligrams per deciliter. I can make your blood pressure 40 over 20 millimeters of mercury. I can do that. <laughs> I can make your blood sugar uh, 20 milligrams per deciliter. I can put you into diabetic coma. I can kill you. I've got, I've got such powerful insulin. I could kill you with a low blood sugar, <laughs> I'm, so, I'm a doctor. But can I make you healthy? I'm not, not unless I fix the problem. You gotta fix the problem, the problem is the food. And then you use these medications for whatever pickup you can get after you've corrected everything you can correct by fixing the, the food. And I do, I use it, listen, I told you I got, I got a prescription pad, I'm a real doctor. And I don't mess around either. I mean, if I think you need a medication, you get it. And I'll tell you why. And if you still feel you don't want it, I'll respect you. Because if I had anything to offer that had only good and no, no evil associated with it, in other words, everything I offered resulted in positive effects and no negative effects, then I wouldn't have any purpose prescribing it to you. But everything I tell you to do, pills, surgeries, everything, it's got a downside to it. And you're the one that's gonna suffer, not me, not the doctor. You're the one that's gonna suffer by decisions made. And so if you say, after listening to all the positive and negative effects to a treatment proposed, that you don't wanna do it, you'll find me respecting your decision. As long as I've explained to you exactly what I think and your doctors ought to be taking care of you the same way. They should tell you the whole truth and nothing but the truth behind what they're doing. Don't leave anything out. They just really leave a lot of stuff out. Don't leave anything out. Tell me the whole story, doc. And so I can just make a decision. It's my body. It's my money. It's my family. You know, you're just an advisor. I just hired you for advice. That's what I hired you for. <laughs> you, you think I, the, these people are just trained consultants. You're hiring. You're the boss. They'll show you respect, I think. Some of them do. Yeah, not all doctors are, are practicing what, what I consider dangerous and inadequate medicine. There are a lot of really good doctors out there. 
And especially there are a lot of them that are trying to do the right thing. And if they are trying to do the right thing, they discover that most people are sick from the food. And then they fix that. Otherwise, they're still playing around with the drug business. And they're never going to get their patients well. You've heard me say a thousand times, I'm the luckiest doctor in the world because my patients get well. When I practice the other kind of medicine, all I did was push pills, push drugs, gave excuses as to why it didn't work, sent you off to mutilating surgeries that in most cases didn't more harm than good. Now, those are the tools I was given. You know, I, I paid a good price, not only four years, seven years of education, but a lot of money to be taught to do the right thing to help you. And these other young doctors out there, they're paying a half a million dollars to learn how to take care of you. You know what? You know what? They forgot to teach you what human beings eat, which is what James McGovern's new law passed by half of Congress, not the senators yet, <laughs> will make it a national requirement that your medical schools have to teach what a human being eats. Just like the SB 380 I got passed for California in 2011. They'll find some way to get around it. They won't, they won't, they're not gonna do anything <laughs> to hurt their bank accounts. Question if the McDougals meditate or do yoga? No. <laughs> do you meditate? I don't meditate. I, don't meditate. I used to do yoga. When we yeah, lived in you, Santa Rosa, you know, there, was, yoga, yeah. there was a really convenient studio around, but um, since we live, uh, since we moved to Portland, I, I haven't done the yoga except for at home once yeah, in a while. And I was never good at yoga, so I didn't <laughs> ever do it. Yeah. I used to windsurf a lot, and that was kind of like meditating. <laughs> I get out there on my board, traveling 34 miles an hour, and I only had one thought on my mind, staying on we that board. We used to meditate when we lived on the Big Island. Yeah, well, that was a, that was a, <laughs> we got a little goofy there for a while. Nice. Um, what about pap smears? Somebody wants to know. Recommend them? Yeah, I do. I recommend pap smears if you're sexually active, because this is a venereal disease that's spread by sexual intercourse. And so if you catch this wart virus, you have an increased risk of uh, getting cervical cancer, which is a terrible disease. So if you're not sexually active, then you're not gonna catch the virus. And uh, I recommend them over the, the people over the age of say 21 or 28. That's, that's early enough to get started. And, and that's the general recommendation by gynecologists worldwide. And I recommend that after two negative smears, you have them done every three to five years which is the recommendation by every gynecology organization worldwide. And I recommend you stop getting pap smears around age 50. Most organizations say around 60, you should stop getting them. Why? Because if you got cervical cancer, you caught this virus, you know, when you're 50 or 60 years old, it takes 30 years to kill you. You're not gonna reap much benefit from catching it early. So you can stop around age 50 or 60, or if you lost your uterus, you had a hysterectomy, you should not be getting pap smears. But between those ages during your sexual activity when you could catch the virus, you know, the evidence is questionable. I have to tell you that, but it's at least strong enough for me to recommend pap smears that they probably do more good than harm in sexually active women. And by the way, oral cancer is spread the same way. It's a venereal disease. And I'm not gonna go into details how I can catch it, but you can figure it out on your own. Or AJ will tell you. <laughs> Yeah, great. Thanks. <laughs> oh, I'll leave that one to you, AJ. You can do a whole show on how you catch oral cancer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, thank you. Oh, my goodness. So we have a question. Uh, if you can stop medication cold turkey, what right. was the medication? I think it was a shoot. I saw it. Uh, how do you find it? So many questions when you come yeah. on. That's why we have you come on so much. I think it was a well, you got to save. You got to save a few questions for me for in two weeks from now. I know they need to. They need to send them in. Okay. Well, we, we can stop now, or we can do. Uh, oh, Lipitor's. That's the one. Can you stop it cold? Yeah, turkey you can stop it cold week? turkey. No, you can stop it. Stop I, if my patients stop it cold turkey, but you have to expect your cholesterol is going to go up if you do. You just stopped a very powerful cholesterol lowering medication, and so don't be surprised if your cholesterol drops thirty, raises thirty points. You just stopped a powerful drug. It may take time for your cholesterol to get down lower. So, 
Yeah. It was a good session, AJ. I okay. hope you we'll, we'll say we'll, we, we had a couple of questions on pulmonary fibrosis and the raw food diet. I'll save them for next time. Right, save those. You'll be back on the 13th of June yeah. with part two of the GI lecture. You bet. And, and th <laughs> thank you very much for a chance to talk to all the folks out there. Uh, you know, you, you guys know that pretty much everything's free on the website. Uh, I've written, Mary and I've written 13 national best selling books. You can go to the website, drmcdougall.com, and you can look up almost anything, and there's an answer for you. And what I would tell you, but, you know, and most, some of you can do it on your own. In fact, a good share you can, but some of you need some extra help. And that's why we've run programs. We've run residential programs, and now we're running a 12-day internet-based telemedicine program where we come right in your home. And I have to emphasize, I got the question again this morning. Well, I went to the residential program in Santa Rosa. I'm not gonna go to the internet program. Excuse me. When we ask people <laughs> who have been through both programs, which they prefer, unanimously, it comes back. I got more out of the internet program. It was, you know, it was half to, to a third of the price. You know, it, I, I cooked in my own kitchen. I didn't have to go home and learn how to cook after the program. I had somebody be with me all day long to help me, our support specialist. I got my questions answered right away, all, all very personally. And I got to spend every morning with John and Mary <laughs> because Mary and I have a fireside chat with all participants every morning. So, hey, listen, life's short. You shouldn't spend any more time and less health or less attractiveness than you deserve. And so let's get it fixed. And we're here to help you. Just go to the website and we'll, get you signed up for the next program, which isn't until July and it'll be sold out. So go soon. Okay. We want to see you. We want to spend 12 days with you. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. McDougall and Murray. We look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. All right. Thank you, AJ. You have a good time. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back in about an hour when I have a very special guest who I'm sure you know and love named Victoria Moran, as we kick off a whole week's worth of show about Main Street Vegan Academy. She's going to set the stage today and then every week from today on, we're going to have a cooking demo from one of her graduates. Take care, everyone. Thanks for hanging in. If you like what you see, please consider giving it a thumbs up and maybe even subscribing to the channel or to my mailing list at chefaj.com and sharing this broadcast with your friends and loved ones. Take care. Bye-bye.